Good morning. This past December, the New Direction Congress passed the Energy Independence and Security Act, a momentous first step towards combating global warming pollution and securing our energy independence. With that down payment in place, Congress now must turn to the next great challenge, enacting an economy-wide cap-and-trade program that will reduce heat-trapping pollution 80 percent by 2050. A cap-and-trade system harnesses the power of the market to ensure that pollution will be cut by a defined amount at the lowest possible cost. Cap-and-trade is an idea that is made in the USA. Its advantages have been demonstrated under the Clean Air Act's highly successful acid rain program. The Europeans have adopted this idea for their emissions trading system for carbon dioxide, and fortunately, we are now in a position to benefit from the lessons we have learned in implementing that system. One of the most important questions that any cap-and-trade system must answer is how tradable pollution allowances should be distributed. Should they be given away for free to polluters, or should they be auctioned off? The acid rain program and the early phases of the EU admissions trading system rely primarily on free allocation. But both economic theory and the EU's recent experience have taught us that giving allowances away may result in massive windfall profits for polluters and surprisingly does not lower costs to consumers. In most cases, polluters will charge consumers for the value of the allowances even if they receive those allowances for free. Auctioning avoids this problem and ensures that allowances distribution is transparent and fair, based on the free market rather than political deals. Auctioning also has the advantage of sending a carbon price signal that is loud and clear, not muffled by special interest giveaways. And finally, auctioning can provide tens of billions of dollars of revenue which can be used to greatly reduce the overall cost of the program and speed the transition to a low carbon economy. By investing auction revenues in technology research and development, efficiency, renewable energy and rebates, and tax cuts for low and middle income households, we can provide a much needed stimulus to the economy, one that will get us out of the doldrums and unleash a clean, green revolution of innovation and prosperity. For all these reasons, economists have long been nearly unanimous in advocating auctioning over free allocation. Now, policymakers around the world are moving decisively towards robust action. As Mr. Zapfel, our witness from the EU, will explain, the European Commission just this morning announced its proposal to move to 100 percent auctioning of allowances for electric utilities by 2013 and to increasing reliance on auctions for other industrial sources. At least six of the northeastern states, including my home state of Massachusetts, representing, represented this morning by Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs Ian Bowles, are planning to use nearly 100 percent auctions to distribute allowances under the Reggie Cap and Trade Program. As Congress begins debate on cap and trade legislation, it is imperative that we learn from these experiences. The health of our planet's atmosphere is a sacred public trust that belongs to all of us, and the right to pollute it should not be given away for free. Nor should we adopt a program that will enrich corporate polluters at consumers' expense. I believe that with a well-designed cap-and-trade program based on robust auctions and revenue recycling, we can do our part to save the planet from global warming in a way that grows our economy, creates jobs, is efficient, transparent and socially equitable. Our distinguished panel of witnesses today is well qualified to help us uh, to, uh, to move forward on this endeavor. I would also at this time like to inform the members uh, that David Moulton, uh, who serves as the Select Committee Staff Director and Chief Counsel, will be leaving that position on February 7th. Uh, David is one of Capitol Hill's most experienced veterans, and much to my regret, he has decided to retire from the Hill 
after more than 25 years of serving in the House and the Senate. Uh, David has been at my side on every major issue I have worked on since 1985, from energy to the environment to telecommunications to consumer protection. Over the last 23 years, he has worked uh, with me on a series of, in a series of capacities, including legislative director, chief of staff in my personal office, and as staff director of the Subcommittee on Telecommunications and Finance uh, before assuming the role of staff director for this committee. Whether it is energy efficiency or the VCHIP, children's educational television or roller coaster safety, protecting the Arctic refuge or fighting global warming, David has been my closest advisor. He has combined a deep commitment to the public interest with a mastery of the legislative process. Over the last year, David played a pivotal role in setting up the Select Committee, and he has helped to grow it into a force for change in this Congress and in the world. David exemplifies all of the best qualities of the staff whose hard work and professionalism make it possible for this institution to serve the public. He combines the soul of John Audubon with the writing talents of Mark Twain. His skills, counsel, and creativity will be greatly missed by me and by all of my staff. David, I want to thank you for all that you have done for me over the years. Uh, you are not only one of the uh, top advisors that anyone in Congress has ever had, but you are also my very dear friend. And I wish the very best to you, uh, your wife Francie, your two uh, daughters, and all of um, uh, your, in all of your endeavors uh, in the years ahead. And I know for myself and all of the staff of the Select Committee and the members of the Select Committee, uh, we offer you our thanks for your public service. Thank you so much. For turn to recognize the ranking mm -hmm. member of the Select Committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, let me say that I think I speak for over 72,000 other people who were in Lambeau Field Sunday night that we don't think global warming is such a bad thing, <laughs> uh, because if it weren't for global warming, it might have been 20 below there rather than just a little bit below the zero margin and the game was bad. Today's hearing will focus on the details of a cap and trade system. Specifically, the hearing will examine how carbon credits and allowances are to be distributed in a cap and trade system. However, I will not be offering much input into this nuanced question because I will oppose a cap and trade regulatory regime and oppose it strongly, no matter how credits are distributed within the system. My reason for opposing this mess is simple. From the outset of the Select Committee, I said that I will oppose any legislative effort that will hurt jobs in the economy. And I am convinced that a cap and trade system will do just that. One needs look no further than Japan, Italy, and Spain to see what quicksand awaits U.S. ratepayers under a cap and trade system. Together, these nations will have to fork over $33 billion to buy carbon credits, according to a November 30th Bloomberg News article. This amounts to a tax on electricity in those countries, since the cost of these credits will probably be hidden in the overall electricity bill. Make no mistake, these costs are the price tag of the Kyoto Treaty. President Bush has received much grief for failing to sign on to that bloated regulatory regime. But after seeing how it is raising electricity costs in Europe and Asia, I am pleased that the President followed my advice and kept the United States out of that bad deal. The question isn't if a cap and trade system will raise electric costs. The question is how much they will raise costs. This is a question that I have been asking over and over today and throughout the year as we continue to examine this issue. When this select committee conducted a field hearing in Seattle last November, 
I engaged with New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg on the differences between a cap and trade system and a direct tax on carbon. While I disagree with Mayor Bloomberg on the need for a carbon tax, we both agreed that at least a carbon tax is an honest attempt to reduce carbon emissions, whereas a cap and trade system simply buries the cost deep within your electric bill. Cap and trade is a politician's dream. It doesn't have to vote for the tax and then can run around and criticize the evil electric companies for passing the cost of these credits on to consumers. It's a dishonest way of doing it. At least Mayor Bloomberg said that if we're going to do this type of a taxing system, we ought to do it the honest way. If politicians in Washington believe it's a good idea to use taxes in an effort to fight global warming, then they should show the ratepayers exactly how much they're spending on these so-called global warming solutions. I think most people would find that to be the real inconvenient truth. Ten years ago when I was chair of the Science Committee, an employee of the Clinton administration testified that the Kyoto Treaty and the cap and trade system that was envisioned in that would raise electric rates by 80 percent. I can't face the senior citizens in my district saying that a pr procedure that I have advocated costs them that much money. And what's going to happen to manufacturing when the cost of energy here goes up that much, but the cost in China doesn't go up at all? Since 2005, Europe has been under a cap and trade system. So far, the results don't look good. Open Europe, a group that studied the system, found that it acted like a wealth transfer mechanism, subsidizing polluters in states making little effort to control carbon emissions while punishing states that had tougher emission allocations. Perhaps the cost of this system would be worth it if they were actually creating measurable improvements to the environment. But as Open Europe notes, this regulatory system has actually led to an increase in emissions from Europe. The American people deserve a technological approach to global warming that improves the environment while protecting the economy. They don't deserve a tax hike that masquerades as a solution. I yield back the balance of my time. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, uh, as always, appreciate the eloquence of our ranking member. Uh, the one, one of the fallacies I hear, though, in his uh, presentation is that we are already paying huge costs as a result of global warming, and the scientific evidence is that it's going to be far greater. The Stern Review uh, suggested that by investing as little as 1 percent of our GDP, uh, we could avoid the worst effects. Failure to avoid the worst effects could have the GDP worldwide dropping 20 percent. I mean, this is a wise investment. And the good news is that a year from now, the United States will no longer be uh, the major, the single holdout of the industrialized countries that don't believe that we're going into a carbon-constrained economy. Uh, it's still open to how that carbon constrained, and it may be that uh, carbon tax has some merit. I am intrigued, as you, Mr. Chairman, with the potential of the carbon, car, cap and trade. Um, it not just may be the key to saving the planet, but it also might be very helpful to get us out of the current economic crisis that we find ourselves in. Because we have systematic weaknesses, economic deficit, environmental deficit, infrastructure deficit. A cap and trade has the potential for creating a great deal of value. Uh, how that is captured and where it is allocated um, is of great interest to me. And I'm going to be posing some questions to this terrific panel that you've assembled to see if there's some way that a portion of this value could be reallocated to deal with crumbling infrastructure, in some cases in the wrong places, invested in the wrong ways, that we might be able to take a portion of it to be able to revitalize the infrastructure, to reduce the carbon footprint over the long run while we stimulate the economy in the foreseeable future and avoid economic catastrophe in the future. Uh, I deeply appreciate this opportunity and look forward to pursuing this. But th be forewarned, this is something I'd like some of our, our witnesses to think about with us. Great. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the hearing, and I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. I also want to apologize. We have an O&I committee hearing uh, with Energy and Commerce, so I'm going to have to be up and down and back and forth today, Mr. Chairman, but I do thank our witnesses for being here, and I uh, thank you that we're going to look at how uh, how a cap-and-trade would be administered and the prospects for such a system, uh, I will tell you right up front, I have some grave concerns about this type carbon reduction scheme because um, of my belief that it would drastically affect the nation's energy supply and would significantly distort the market. So I join my colleagues in letting you know that I do have some questions. Uh, that I would pose to you. Now, I know that proponents of the cap-and-trade system argue that the system is necessary because humans are causing global climate change through emissions of carbon dioxide, and therefore we have to institute something that is going to drive a change to this human behavior. But then we turn around, and in our study and research, I've read several things in some of our scientific journals from the past decade that show that most, if not all, of our recent global warming is caused by the sun and other natural causes and cannot be specifically and irrefutably linked to human activity. And if these schemes were to be implemented, they would have little to no effect in changing the current projected rate of temperature more than a couple of degrees over 100 years. So I think that it is our responsibility, it's this committee and it's Congress's responsibility to take reasonable actions to protect the environment, but closing coal plants and imposing massive energy costs on consumers in developing nations is, in my opinion, not the way we ought to go. A cap-and-trade or a carbon tax system will likely lead to shuttering many of the power plants that are in existence today and would compromise the American job market and could lead to a greater dependence on foreign energy sources rather than driving us toward energy independence. And all of this would have a negligible uh, the actions would end up having a negligible environmental effect. And in my opinion, that may be a little bit too steep a price to pay. This past uh, summer, several of my colleagues and I traveled to Europe and firsthand, had some firsthand visits with those on the cap and trade system. It raised some concerns. We look forward to hearing from you today. I yield back. Great. Gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington. Mr. Inslee. I was talking to the president of the National Academy of Sciences the other day, and he wasn't worried about the sun wobbling around or sunspots destroying the climatic system of the Earth. This is a problem we got to tackle, and I'm glad we're here because if we don't solve this problem, nothing else matters. I want to make three comments about cap and trade. First, those who are critical of a cap and trade system, I would just simply say, as they say in Texas, show me what you've got. Show me what you've got to solve this problem. And those who who criticize this and approach for a lot of their criticisms never come up with another system to solve this problem. It is the best system we have available and we should implement it. Second, for those who argue that a cap and trade system is sort of a chimera, it's just kind of a, a camouflage system trying to avoid responsibility, I would suggest the reason it's important is the first word. It is a cap. And a carbon tax does not have a cap. A carbon tax makes some assumptions about behavior that may or may not be true. What the European experience has been, a tax alone does not and cannot solve the problem. You have to have a hard, meaningful, concrete, impenetrable, legally enforceable cap. And this we can inform our constituents, uh, guarantee our constituents, we're going to uh, tell our grandkids we're going to have a solid, enforceable limitation on how many megatons of CO2 we're putting in the atmosphere. Third, the most important debate we will have in the next 12 months is on an auction, because there are some things we can learn from Europe. It's true they don't know what football is, but there are some things we can learn from them. And the number one lesson from Europe is that you have to have an auction if you're going to have a meaningfully successful cap and trade system, both for reasons of equity, because of the tragedy of the commons that they first brainwashed me about in economics back 36 years ago, but also because it has to work that way from an equity standpoint and an enforcement standpoint by putting a price on carbon. That is a lesson from Europe. They have learned it. 
We don't have to go through their painful first few years. We can learn from their experience. And I'll be working on legislation to have the earliest implementation of 100 percent auction as, as soon as humanly and politically possible. It is what is, I believe, will be the single most, debate, most important debate we have in Congress this year. And we hope that the forces of auction prevail for our grandkids' sake. It's a lesson from Europe. We ought to learn it. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the panel for coming here today. Uh, the cap and trade policies that are ultimately adopted by this government are not only extremely important, but uh, it's also an extremely interesting process. Uh, speaking as a, as, a, as a scientist, I look forward to getting into some of these details and having some fun mucking around. Uh, but in particular, such a program will determine the direction of our economy. It will help or hurt our poor, our lower income people. It will guide industry and, if done properly, will make America a leader as we move forward into the 21st century. So uh, with little or no pressure on the panel, I look forward to your testimony. And I reserve the balance of my time. Great. The gentleman can do that. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentlelady from South Dakota, uh, Ms. Herseth Sandler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll reserve my time for questions as well. Thank you. Great. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson. Thank you very uh, much, Mr. Chairman. I, too, look forward to the testimony. And I feel somewhat like that old George Goble line. I feel like a pair of brown shoes at a black tuxedo event. I do favor uh, very strongly a, uh, a, a specific tax credit, carbon tax credit, because I think that that's the most direct, most efficient means of us uh, accomplishing a goal. I uh, am skeptical about the cap and trade and remain to be convinced and certainly are anxious to hear from our panelists uh, uh, today, but I'm especially concerned uh, about the auction and about where the, how the auction takes place, how a cap and trade is going to be administered, what's going to happen downline to people when we know the costs are going to rise. I especially am concerned in the Northeast about my, uh, the, the constituents that I represent. And uh, I feel that there would be more advantage by making sure that we had a payroll tax deduction specifically tied to a carbon tax uh, that would both benefit them and I think provide both an appropriate cap and a, a path forward for us to solve this very difficult problem. I think it's also, uh, will be helpful to us in dealing with our foreign partners, most notably in, in China and uh, in India, because of the transparency issues that uh, obviously exist, but I remain to be convinced otherwise. The gentleman's time has expired, and all time for opening statements from the members has uh, been completed. So we'll now turn to our panel. And we'll hear first from Mr. Dallas uh, Bertraud, uh, he is a senior fellow at Resources for the Future. Mr. Bertraud is an economist who is recognized as one of the leading national experts on emissions cap and trade systems. He has worked in this area for the past two decades and has played an important role in evaluating the Clean Air Act's acid rain program and has worked extensively on the Northeastern States REGI program and on the EU's emissions trading system. We welcome you. Mr. Bertrand, whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Resources for the future uh, neither lobbies nor takes positions on specific legislative or regulatory proposals, so I emphasize that the views I present today are my own. I mean, I'm going to talk specifically about the question of how emission allowances are allocated or initially distributed <coughs> in the implementation of a cap and trade program by addressing several specific questions. One of the first is that what is the efficiency benefits of auctions? There are not many viewpoints that you can get most economists to agree on, but one of them is that the role of an auction in the implementation of a emissions cap and trade program delivers significant efficiency benefits. One perceived virtue of auctions is that they are consistent with the principle of simplicity and transparency, which is valuable in the formation of a new market. Second and equally forceful, the reason that economists favor an auction is that it makes funds available that can be used to achieve other goals. Depending on how these revenues are used, they can help in an important way to reduce the economic costs of climate policy. For the purposes of minimizing the costs and promoting economic growth, economists would favor dedicating the use of revenues from an auction to reduce pre-existing taxes. 
A second approach would be to reinvest some portion of allowance value to reinforce policy goals. For example, in the 10-state Northeast Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative that takes, place, takes effect in 2009, at least 25 percent of the allowance value, which would be realized through an auction, is to be budgeted to consumer benefits such as investments in energy efficiency. A third idea is that even a relatively small sliver of auction revenues would provide a relatively substantial infusion of support for research and development for, of new technologies. I know that others on this panel have other ideas that deserve consideration uh, on this revenue question. Second, would free allocation of allowances significantly reduce economic impacts on consumers? Well, the, gro the group that is most affected by co climate policy will be consumers. In the electricity sector under an auction, although we find that some electricity generators are going to bear some costs under an auction, consumers of electricity bear about eight times greater costs. This results because generators are able to pass along the cost to consumers through increasing prices. Free allocation of emission allowances to generators cannot be expected to reduce this impact where there are competitive markets. The only important exception is in that portion of the electricity sector where there are regulated prices, and in these regions, consumers would benefit from free allocation to firms. However, in general, throughout the economy, the ability of firms to pass on the cost of allowances does not hinge on how they receive the allowances initially. Sometimes one hears Firms argue to the contrary, saying they would not charge their customers for emission allowances they receive for free. When one hears this, one might think that a different conversation needs to be had between those firms and their shareholders, because it is shareholder value they would be giving away. The fact that a firm in a competitive market will charge its customers for the use of an asset that the firm has received for free is often a difficult idea for people to grasp at first, but it is wholly consistent with economic theory and is in general what has been observed in empirical studies. In general, giving allowances away for free to firms will provide little benefit to consumers. There is one way that consumers could benefit from free allocation, however, and that is if citizens were to receive allowance value directly. This approach has been called a cap and rebate to every person with a social security number. Number three, what, to what extent do auctions deprive polluters of capital needed to invest in achieving substantial reductions in greenhouse gases? Well, in the electricity sector, most new investment in generation relies on project-specific financing, meaning that each project is evaluated and financed independently with capital from outside the firm. As a consequence, the implementation of an auction will not affect the availability of capital for financing new projects in the important electricity sector. What proportion of allowance value is needed to compensate polluting firms? Overall, Economic estimates suggest that the loss in market value of industries that are going to be heavily affected by climate policy is less than 30 percent of the value of emission allowances. This estimate masks some differences among firms because many firms turn out to be winners and some firms are losers. In the electricity sector, which again is, a, is the center of much attention, the industry as a whole would require just 6 percent of allowance value. But this accounts for firms that gain value and to compensate only the losers would require about 11 percent of the allowance value. Is it feasible to allocate, uh, to, to construct an allocation formula that would efficiently target compensation to those firms that are adversely affected? The, the award of free allowances is a blunt instrument for achieving compensation for producers. Free allocation tends to reward winners as well as losers, thereby eroding efficiency and the ability to compensate other affected parties. We find the opportunity cost of compensation to producers in the electricity sector is five times the compensation, the cost of compensation delivered successfully. The difference accrues to firms as windfall profits. One way to improve this would be to apportion allowances to the states and let the states conduct allocation to achieve compensation goals. This cuts in half, roughly, the cost of achieving compensation, or more modest compensation targets also reduces the costs. Nonetheless, under any strategy, there are important considerations regarding the difficulty of achieving uh, compensation. And finally, to what extent are economic impacts of legislation on polluting firms likely to be spread among shareholders who hold diversified portfolios? In this modern age, the vast majority of shareholders hold few, if any, stocks in individual companies. Most of us hold assets in mutual funds. For this reason, the way to deliver compensation to owners of equity is to design an efficient policy in order to lessen the overall cost of the policy, which is precisely the virtue of the use of auctions. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, sir, uh, very much. Uh, our second witness is Mr. Peter Zapfel. Uh, Mr. Zapfel is the coordinator for carbon markets and energy policy for the European Commission. Mr. Zapfel has represented the European Commission as a delegation member in the UN climate negotiations and has been actively involved in the Commission's work on emissions allowance trading, including the EU's proposal just released today. Uh, to transform the EU admission system uh, post-2012. 
I would like to state for the record that the uh, Committee appreciates Mr. Zapfel's voluntary participation. The Committee recognizes that because of Mr. Zapfel's status as a representative of the European Commission, neither Congress nor the Committee have legal authority over his presentation today. We welcome you, Mr. Zapfel, and whenever you are ready, please begin. Mr. Chairman, members of the Committee, it's on. Uh, it's a pleasure to testify today, in particular, as you alluded already, before we have earlier this morning, when you were getting out of your beds, uh, the European Commission has stabled a set of legislative proposals to implement our far-reaching climate and energy policy goals uh, for the next decade. Uh, it's uh, what I'd like to do in my five minutes of intervention here, focusing on auctioning, uh, give you some uh, information of what we have proposed this morning, uh, why we have proposed to go to auctioning as a, the main method of allocation, give uh, uh, some experience we have with free allocation, and end up with a few recommendations. Uh, before going into auctioning, I also, however, want to uh, point out that the core of our proposal this morning on uh, reviewing our carbon trading scheme is the proposal to bring down the, the emissions cap, the number of allowed emissions, by 21% in 2020 compared to the emissions level in the trading scheme in 2005. So we have a very robust emissions cap proposed that will drive forward the carbon market uh, and deliver environmental benefits and also create a well-functioning carbon market. Uh, the Commission has this morning proposed that uh, as of 2013, as of the start of the third trading period, we make uh, uh, auctioning the main method of allocating allowances and we go into a transition so that, uh, as by 2020, in principle, auctioning is the only method of allocating allowances to the European carbon market. Free allocation would immediately end at the end of the second trading period in 2012 for power plants, and for other industrial installations in other sectors covered by our scheme, free allocation would be phased out over an eight-year period so that by the end of the third trading period in 2020, we would no longer, in principle, have free allocation. Why have we made these proposals? We see three merits in principle for auctioning. Auctioning has merits in simplicity. Auctioning has merits in transparency. And auctioning is also seen advantageous from our side for the efficiency and the clear carbon price signal that it creates. What experience do we have in Europe with free allocation for the first eight years, the first two phases of our scheme? Free allocation is a very complex process to handle. There's a lot of economic, uh, the asset value of the allowances, of the carbon allowances is considerable. And for the formulas you need to devise to allocate the allowances free of charge, you need a lot of data, which is a heavily admit administratively very cumbersome process, the first point. The second point, a free allocation is a very, it tends to be a, a rather intransparent process, how this major asset value is allocated into the allowance market. Thirdly, thirdly, because of the periodic nature that we do the allocation process, and because of the possibility and actual that rules for free allocation change from period to period, uh, this has the potential to actually distort decision making by actors in the market, and has in fact to some extent distorted decision making. And fourthly, as, as has already been alluded in introductory statements, free allocation creates undue distributional advantages for some sectors in the sense that the additional costs, uh, the additional uh, benefits in terms of uh, companies increasing their prices far outweigh the additional costs and they create something which is called politically windfall profits. Uh, finally, as I said, some uh, recommendation. I think we reckon in the European Union that auctioning as a method of allocating emission allowances is, is a fairly new thing in emission markets. There are several environmental markets operated here in the United States. Some auctioning has taken place there. Also, we in Europe at this stage, we have limited experience with auctioning. Uh, but there's a number of, in a number of, of fields on a daily basis, on a very regular basis, governments organize the allocation of economic assets via auctions. And we can learn a great deal from such other government-driven auctions, for example, for government bonds, for spectrum licenses. So, so we, can, we are not starting something completely new uh, with uh, transiting to auctioning as the main method of allocating carbon allowances. There's two things I want to raise at the end of my testimony of uh, what is crucial in our view to make auctioning a successful mechanism of allocating allowances. First of all, we think we need to take time to, uh, to design the auction mechanism very well. 
That's why we have proposed today that just in principle we want to go to auctioning, but we will work out in, as part of the implementation process a detailed regulation, and we want to uh, work a lot with stakeholders, with the experts in financial markets to design a well-functioning au auctioning mechanism because the, asset, the economic assets involved are considerable, so we need more time to work that out in, in a good way. And secondly, uh, we need smart ways of, of recycling the revenues from the auctioning. There's various things to which the allowance value, the, the revenue can be put to, and there's further work to be done in, in working out, in a, as I say, in a smart and effective way to allocate, uh, to, uh, to recycle the revenues. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Zapfel. We very much appreciate your being here today. Um, next, we have Ian Bowles. Uh, he is the Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs for my home state of Massachusetts. He is a recognized national leader in uh, climate and energy policy. Secretary Bowles oversees the state's six environmental, natural resources, and energy regulatory agencies. Amongst other things, Secretary Bowles has the lead role in Massachusetts' implementation of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or REGI. Uh, prior to serving as Secretary, Mr. Bowles was Associate Director of the White House uh, Council on Environmental Quality for President Clinton. Uh, we welcome you, Mr. Secretary. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for your focus on this tremendously important topic today. I'm delighted to be here. Um, my comments today reflect the general context in New England. We have expensive electricity. We have no indigenous coal and natural gas, face transportation costs to bring those fuels to our region. We have, on average, lower greenhouse gas emissions than the rest of the nation. And we have, across New England, a deregulated power market. Uh, Massachusetts, we've also made, and other New England states have as well, considerable investments in energy efficiency. And in Massachusetts, we're currently in a rate decoupling proceeding where we're trying to eliminate the current economic incentive on our distribution utilities to maximize power sales at a time when we're trying to cut greenhouse gas emissions. We already have in place some limited greenhouse gas limits on our power plants. And as the chairman noted, we're in the process of transitioning to the REGI system uh, the first of next year. Uh, in renewable energy, we're moving forward with three new biomass power plants, the Cape Wind Project, a sizable solar program, and new incentives for biofuels. Uh, and as the chairman noted, we've combined first state and the nation to do so, our energy and environmental agencies together to focus on three key things, tapping the economic potential of the burgeoning clean energy sector sector in Massachusetts. We've got a quarter billion dollars of private venture capital investment and a great deal of job creation in that area. Second, curbing our greenhouse gas emissions. And third, reducing our energy costs. When Governor Patrick brought Massachusetts into the REGI process early last year, one of the central questions we faced was whether to auction uh, our for allowances or whether to grant them. Based on our analysis, we concluded that auctioning was a better way to protect the interests of the ratepayer. And the core thing to know there is that in a deregulated power market, uh, the value, the economic value, the market value of, a, of an allowance is going to make its way into the electricity bill one way or another, whether that generator decides to expend the allowance as they dispatch power to the grid, whether they save those allowances for a future generation uh, uh, event in the future, or whether they decide to sell those allowances. And either way, that value is priced in whether or not that allowance is given out or whether it's sold to the generator. On the contrary, if you sell it uh, to the generator, then you've got those uh, revenues to do something with, and you can protect uh, the ratepayers. And that's what we decided to do uh, with our auction proceeds. And our first uh, auctions begin uh, in the second quarter of this year as we move into the uh, compliance period uh, for REGI. As we did an analysis of what we should spend those money on that would best protect the ratepayer and achieve our environmental objectives, uh, energy efficiency stood out above all else. Uh, we have the opportunity to not only save money for the ratepayers, uh, but also to lock in permanent greenhouse gas emissions uh, reductions. In terms of the cost of REGI, uh, we see in the first couple years less than a 1 percent increase uh, in potential electricity bills. And as energy efficiency investments grab hold and accrue over time, within 10 years, we see over 5 percent energy savings. Now, why is that? Uh, it's because we've got a great deal of energy efficiency left in our system and, indeed, across the nation that is cheaper in many cases than power generation. In terms of how much revenue we're going to produce, if it's a $1 uh, permit, you'll 
will produce about 26 million. If it's a $5 permit, it will be 133 million. At the higher end of that scale, we'll be effectively doubling our investment in energy efficiency uh, in the Commonwealth. As you think about a federal system, I'd make a couple key points. One uh, is that states, I think, are best positioned to deliver uh, energy efficiency services. It's not something where the federal government is somewhat too removed from uh, the individual ratepayers and the end use consumers. And it's something that states have done a great deal on. Uh, and I think you could have set up objective standards to say what are the performance basis uh, that we'd like to see for use of proceeds down at the state level um, for energy efficiency. I'd also make the point that uh, as compared to a grandfathering scheme where you're giving out allowances, um, the auctions really level the playing field across all the different sectors uh, instead of building in uh, un potentially unfair treatment for uh, for early movers. Um, as we conduct our auctions this summer, we're going to focus on a few things. I'll mention them quickly and happy to get into more detail on the question. Uh, we're going to have our auctions open to any qualified buyer. As we watch the market uh, develop, we may add rules in the future uh, to make sure there isn't any hoarding or anything of that nature. We're going to have a sophisticated market monitoring system so we know who some of the players are. And then as we go forward, we're going to use a three-year compliance uh, period to allow some flexibility between years because emissions uh, vary depending on things like um, weather events. Uh, finally, I just would mention I've submitted a longer 10-page appendix, um, and I'd be delighted to take questions. And I thank you for your focus on this. Uh, we in the States look forward to engaging with the Congress uh, as you move forward. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, very much. Our next witness, Mr. John Podester, is the President and CEO of the Center for American Progress. Mr. Podesta served as Chief of Staff to President Bill Clinton from October to January, from October of 1998 uh, to January of 2001, where he was responsible for directing, managing, and overseeing all policy development, daily operations, and staff activities of the White House. Mr. Podesta has also held a number of other senior positions on Capitol Hill and in the White House and is a recognized expert on technology policy, amongst other areas. We are very fortunate to have him here with us today. We welcome you back, John. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I started with David Moulton, but they kicked me out a lot faster. So <laughs> it's good, nice to be back here. Uh, you've got my full, full statement. I'd like to make uh, four quick points. First, I'd like to take this up a notch. Uh, make no mistake, uh, while it may be slow moving, I think we're in a crisis. Uh, as our understanding of the implications of global warming increased, the case for dramatic immediate action is only made stronger. Just last week, we learned that the Western Antarctic ice sheet is melting faster than rates uh, at a rate that is, was anticipated. This could mean a sea level rise of two meters, uh, as Dr. Pachari noted in this century, uh, not the inches or feet as originally predicted by the IPCC fourth assessment, which will threaten population centers, agricultural patterns, and coastal ecosystems around the world. Perhaps the best we can hope for, and certainly the least we ought to plan for, is a climate that will cause, uh, cause severe economic dislocation uh, and national security challenges to the United States. Worldwide, we are already feeling some of the economic consequences of, of climate change. Uh, we will soon feel the national security consequences of human migration, food shortages, water scarcity, destructive weather events, spread of disease, and national resource competition. The challenge I think we face as a nation and a world is nothing short of conversion of our economy uh, from a, uh, that's sustained by high carbon energy uh, putting both our national security and the health of our planet at risk to one based on low carbon sustainable sources of energy. The scale of that undertaking is immense, but its potential, as the chairman noted, uh, is also uh, enormous. My second point uh, is that energy policy is economic policy. In order to reverse the economic downturn we are currently facing and to capture the opportunities provided by a low carbon energy transformation, we must put energy at the center of our nation's economic growth. Fundamentally changing how we produce and consume energy, investing in low-carbon innovation, and transforming our economy to a low-carbon model are key to promoting economic growth, mobility, job creation, and regaining the technological leadership in the global innovation marketplace. Mr. Uh, Sensenbrenner noted a 10-year-old EIA uh, projection, which proves, I think, in more recent projections to be wrong. I would note that 10 years ago, the United States had 44 percent of the solar market. Today, we have 9 percent, a loss mostly to Japan and uh, Germany. 
Uh, the United States Congress, I think the jobs of the future are clearly on the clean energy side. The U.S. Congress obviously realizes the importance of energy policy to the economy. I, I uh, commend uh, the, the Congress for passing the 2007 energy bill and particularly to, for your uh, work, Mr. Chairman, over the years on, uh, on the raising the CAFE standard. Uh, uh, the Center for American Progress recently released a report entitled Capturing the Energy uh, opportunity that laid out a strategy that we believe is pro-growth, provides opportunity, and takes on global warming um, all in a fiscally responsible way. At the core of that strategy is a fundamental commitment uh, of the Federal Government to invest in green-collar jobs, research and development, and deployment of low-carbon technology, and to assist low- and middle-income Americans with rising energy costs, as Bob will speak about. Uh, my third point is that a cap-and-trade system needs to be at the center of that energy policy. CAP advocates an energy strategy that employs both a cap and trade system and a suite of public investment policies funded by the auction revenue of carbon permits. A cap and trade will identify the necessary level of carbon reductions to get us to a point uh, where we have a sustainable uh, planet and allow the marketplace to price the cost of those emissions. In order to avoid a windfall profit for polluting industries, we recommend auctioning 100 percent of the carbon credits. Our proposal would allocate 10 percent of auction revenue to businesses operating in energy in intensive sectors to compensate shareholders, employees and communities in those sectors. We recommend half of the remaining 90 percent of the revenue be allocated to low and moderate income Americans to help set offset energy uh, price increases. We, uh, polluting industries and not hardworking American families should shoulder the burden of this transformation. Uh, to uh, a new uh, energy in future and to ensure that low and moderate income Americans are protected from short-term increases uh, in energy costs. We estimate uh, and uh, commit $336 billion over 10 years uh, for income support and for uh, middle class uh, tax support. Uh, the remaining half the rem uh, revenue would go to spur science and technology innovation, drive transition to a low carbon uh, economy by funding R&D, efficiency, uh, as Ian has mentioned, and other initiatives, including infrastructure uh, investment, Mr. Blumenauer. Uh, to meet the overall goal of emissions reduction under this cap and trade model, uh, we recommend adopting complementary policies. Uh, for example, we support uh, going further than uh, the, uh, what the Congress has recently passed and uh, implementing a 55 mile per gallon uh, uh, CAFE standard by 2030, improving our distribution and fueling infrastructure, investing in transportation infrastructure, uh, and, other, and another suite uh, on the electricity side, uh, including uh, uh, creating a performance standard for all new coal-fired facilities equivalent to the best available uh, carbon capture and store technology. So my last point, uh, and I will conclude by saying that we cannot continue waiting to jumpstart this energy transformation. Adopting a combination of short-term stimulus and long-term public investment policies will not only enable to, for the U.S. to be, once again become a world leader in low-carbon energy innovation, but will also diversify our energy base, thus fostering economic stability helping uh, to boost economic growth, creating new, new green-collar jobs, uh, and boosting uh, productivity uh, for our economy. We think we can create a virtuous cycle and a win-win situation for the American public. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Podesta. <clears throat> and our final witness, uh, Mr. Robert Greenstein, the founder and executive director of the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Mr. Greenstein has written numerous reports, analysis, and articles on budget and poverty-related issues, including most recently how best to design climate policies to address impacts on low-income households. For his outstanding work at the Center, Mr. Greenstein was awarded a MacArthur Fellowship. Uh, we welcome you here today, and whenever you're ready, please begin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My focus is on the effects that climate change policies can have on the budgets of American families and the federal budget and the implications that has for the design of a cap and trade system. Our analysis indicates that Congress can design climate change policy that's environmentally sound and fiscally responsible, treats consumers fairly, and avoids increases in poverty. But to do so, the policy will have to be well designed and it will need to generate sufficient revenue to meet the requirements of sound climate change policy and mitigate the impacts on vulnerable populations. That means it will be essential to auction most or all of the allowances. Our analysis of these issues can be summed up in four key numbers. Number one, 
$750 to $950 per year. That is the average increase in energy-related costs for the poorest fifth of the population from a quite modest 15 percent reduction in emissions, the kind of target that's often mentioned for, say, 2020. As you know, climate change policies work in part by raising the price of fossil fuel energy products to encourage efficiency and the substitution of clean energy sources. Uh, that will raise costs to consumers for a variety of items, from gasoline and electricity to food man tra mass transit and other products that have energy inputs. Households with limited incomes will be affected the most because they spend a larger share of their income on energy-related products than more affluent households do, and they also are less able to afford investments that can reduce their energy consumption, such as buying a new energy-efficient car or going out and buying a new heating system for their home. If climate change legislation is passed but nothing is done to protect people of limited means, more of them will slip into poverty, those who are poor will become poorer, and the trend towards widening income inequality will be aggravated. Now, let me give you a little context. This figure of $750 to $950 per year in increased costs for the bottom fifth of the population from a 15 percent reduction in emissions, the people in question, the bottom fifth of the population, have average income of only a little over $13,000 a year. So $750 to $950 would be a big hit on them. Figure number two. $50 billion to $300 billion per year. That is the Congressional Budget Office estimate of the resources potentially generated by climate change policies. That's CBO's estimate of the value of the emissions permits under a cap-and-trade system. In other words, it is the amount of the proceeds the government would receive if the permits were fully auctioned off. Key figure number three, approximately 14 percent. That's the share of the auction proceeds needed to fully offset the increased energy costs that low-income consumers would face. In my written testimony, I outline principles for designing way, a mechanism, an approach to fully and efficiently offset the increased energy costs on the bottom 20 percent of the U.S. population and also provide some relief to hard-pressed working families in the next to the bottom 20 percent. That could all be done for about 14 percent, that's one-seventh of the value of the proceeds from auctioning off the permits in a cap-and-trade system. Now, if Congress wanted to assist middle-income consumers as well, that could be accomplished if a somewhat larger share of the proceeds were used for that purpose. For example, with approximately half of the allowance value, half of the value of the permits, Congress could fully compensate the bottom 60 percent of Americans and provide significant compensation to the next 20 percent, leaving out only the most affluent 20 percent, which is the group that consumes the most energy and is most able to afford to make sizable adjustments in their consumption patterns. My final, my fourth key number, less than 15 percent. That is the Congressional Budget Office estimate of the share of the allowance value that is needed to fully compensate energy companies and other emitters for financial losses due to climate change policies. A CBO has conducted a review of all the literature in the field. Uh, there are a number of studies have been conducted. Uh, the broad set of findings are that the uh, net impact on the emitters uh, could be, in terms of potential economic losses, uh, would be offset for less than 15 percent of the permits. And CBO has called the provision of a larger share of the permits free to emitters as an approach that would result in CBO's terms windfall profits for the companies receiving the free allowances. Now, there's a misconception, Mr. Chairman, you referred to it in your opening remarks, a misconception some have that energy prices will not rise or not rise as much if the allowances are given away. Uh, but that 
belief flies in the face of the basic laws of supply and demand. A cap on emissions will limit the supply of energy from fossil fuels, and when supply is restricted, prices rise. Regardless of whether the government gives away or sells the allowances, the energy companies will be able to sell their products at the higher price. They will be able to charge what the market will bear. Harvard economist Greg Mankiw, who served as chair of President George W. Bush's Council of Economic Advisors, has characterized a cap and trade mechanism in which the allowances are given away in large numbers for free as a form of, in Mankiw's term, words, corporate welfare. Now, if you could please summarize. Uh, one la uh, let me summarize. The, the final thing I simply wanted to uh, mention uh, was the impact on budgets. Higher energy prices will raise the cost of federal, state, and local uh, services. Um, the cost of heating schools, hospitals, and the like will go up. Cost of living adjustments for Social Security and veterans programs will need to be higher to reflect the higher energy costs. The Pentagon is the nation's single largest consumer of energy, and its costs will rise. Those can all be addressed, too, those issues, by devoting a share of the permits to offsetting the resulting increases in federal, state, and local costs, all of which comes back to the same issue. All these things can be taken care of if most or all of the permits are auctioned off. If they are not, you get a potential for increased poverty, increased deficits in debt from the higher government costs alongside windfall profits for emitters. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Greenstein, very much. And uh, now we'll turn to questions from the uh, Select Committee, and the Chair will recognize himself. Uh, Mr. Zapfel, thank you again for uh, being here today. It's uh, very important to us. Um, the EU is uh, making a big change today. Uh, they're moving in a completely different direction than they did in their original uh, phase in uh, dealing with uh, greenhouse gas emissions. What happened when the, um, when the uh, allocation um, was free for the various sectors of the European economy? What was it that you found happened? Thank you, Chairman. As a, I, I as I pointed out before, when we have now four years, we go into the fourth year of free allocation now, in our first trading period and also in our second trading period, we have predominantly free allocation. What we learned very early on, even before our trading scheme started via the future markets on the side of, of the power prices, that uh, the value of the allowances gets priced into, the, into electric, first and foremost into electricity. We continue to do ongoing economic assessment. Uh, our scheme is not just going into its fourth year. Uh, there is empirical evidence we continue to learn. But in principle, we see that even, as has been said before, even if the allowances are given for free, some sectors find it fairly easily uh, to include the value of the allowances into their prices. And uh, this, is, uh, this distributional effect is something that has uh, uh, that has uh, resulted in a lot of debate in Europe and is actually one of the motivating factors uh, that we have made the proposals that we have made today. Okay, so how do you deal with the challenge? Many people say that, um, that uh, this is an unprecedented step that you're taking uh, and that uh, industry is unprepared to deal with the consequences of having uh, an auction system. What is your response to that? It's not something we do overnight. As you know, we are now in the year of 2008, and uh, the proposal is that these changes come in in the year 2013. In principle, overall, in the design of the regulatory framework for our carbon market, we pay a lot of attention to that we, uh, that we give this new market sufficient regulatory stability. And one of the key issues there is that we give sufficient foresight so we don't do changes overnight. We had, for example, a lot of debate whether we should already change our rules uh, on very short notice so that the second uh, phase will already see regulatory changes. Uh, the Commission has not uh, entered in such changes because we think for the market to develop well to work efficiently, it needs sufficient uh, lead time so that everybody can prepare to the rule changes. And, and how are you dealing with uh, industry opposition? Which, and which industries are most opposed to, the, to moving to an, uh, an auction system? Uh, as I think as also as you said before, I think we are not the only ones across the world who is uh, considering or um, uh, starting a legislative debate to move towards auctioning. 
We, of course, follow very carefully the debate in the United States. We have seen what's happening in the Reggie system, or what, is, what has been decided in the Reggie system. There's other carbon markets designed around the world, in Australia, New Zealand. There's a debate here. So, so we, I think we are moving along an, an international trend that is developing. Of course, I think from the perspective of an individual business, if you are subject to a carbon cap, it's always uh, a preference for an industry to, to ask for free allowance rather than to have to pay for the allowance. I think that that's a natural opposition that we have in a political process. What is important to us there is we continue to empirically evaluate what are the real effects, what empirical evidence do we have. And as I said, there so far there's no compelling empir empirical evidence that uh, this is damaging. Uh, what we reckon is some sectors, as I said, the power sector can move quicker and other sectors need some time to adapt, like other industrial sectors, which we give more time to adapt to those changes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Podesta, you're an expert on the budget and appropriations process. Uh, what recommendations would you make to ensure that any revenues that do come from an auction system are in fact preserved uh, for uh, R&D, uh, are preserved to take care of the poorest citizens who may be affected by um, this very dramatic change in the way in which we uh, regulate uh, energy in our country. Sorry. Uh, uh, Mr. Markey, I, th that's a very good question, but I think that we've dealt with it before in, in the Land and Water Conservation Fund and other funds that could be segregated either through the direct appropriations process uh, or moving in the direction uh, that uh, we see, in the, if, for example, in the uh, Lieberman-Warner bill where the, the uh, money uh, is deposited directly into certain accounts that would be used only for the purposes uh, that would be put forward. Uh, but I think that's, a, that's in, in the end of the day, uh, I think a critical question to, sh to ensure that the money goes to both uh, what Mr. Greenstein spoke about, which is to cushion the burden. Again, in our proposal, we take it up to the middle class so that they, uh, while they may see net increases in their energy pricing, uh, we also believe that the, their energy bills can be, uh, over the, over the midterm at least, bend down, as we've seen in California, because they're using less energy as efficiency is driven through the system. But ultimately, they're going to pay a little bit more, uh, and we think that those, those accounts need to be balanced and that the structure of the cap-and-trade system uh, needs to, needs to uh, uh, essentially fence off that money so that, that both those things can take place, the right kind of investments, and, and protection of, uh, of working people in this country. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bedester. And again, Mr. Zappel, thank you for being here. We feel like we're here on day one at 8 a.m. of the new era of auctioning. And, uh, and, and I personally just want to praise the European Union for their courage in moving in that direction. I think it is the correct direction. Chair's time has expired, and I recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I think we all know, uh, there's a great deal of concern about the direction our economy is taking, and the fix is on for a bipartisan economic stimulus package, and the debate is over uh, not whether to stimulate the economy, but how best to do it. And the bottom line is, is that there will be money pumped into the economy uh, uh, to try to prevent a recession from occurring or, or worse. Now, I'm a member of Congress, and everybody up here is a member of Congress. How does a member of Congress justify voting to pump money into the economy in an economic stimulus package and then turn around and uh, support a cap and trade program which takes money out of the economy and could cost both consumers and businesses billions of dollars. And let me start with you, Mr. Podesta, since your advice is always very good to members of Congress. Well, Mr. Sensenbrenner, I don't think you need to have that net impact. In fact, I think, as I said, you could create the virtuous cycle of taking uh, money out of the economy that's going towards polluting the atmosphere, mm -hmm. uh, creating a worldwide crisis, causing us long-term national security mm -hmm. uh, problems that will that will require us uh, to put more money into defense and other oh, oh, things. Oh, Take that okay. money out from the pollution side, put it back in okay. by, through rebates er, to low-income er, people, middle-class people, okay. and investments that will build okay. a long-term economy. Okay. First of all, we don't need to get into the science, but CO2 is not a pollutant. CO2 is a naturally occurring gas. It's not like sulfur dioxide or something like that. Every time we exhale, we exhale CO2, and that's not polluting this I, room. I never thought I'd say this, but 
I agree with the Supreme Court and disagree with you, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Well, <laughs> Supreme Court's not right all the time either. So uh, I agree with that. Okay, yeah. And well, the thing is, is you know, let let me continue on this. In 2000, the CBO uh, did a study on cap and trade system and determined that the cap and trade system would be tremendously regressive. Now, I think that both you and Mr. Greenstein uh, seem to indicate that without tinkering around. Uh, with the cap and trade system, uh, it, it would be regressive. Uh, and without the tinkering around, uh, we end up giving carbon breaks for the rich, uh, using carbon instead of tax in the ver debate in the vernacular. Uh, if we go the, the tinkering around, which people are debating about, aren't we turning cap and trade into a wealth redistribution system? Mr. Could Greenstein? I, I answer that? I, I would say the answer is. No. Under a cap-and-trade system, you have a decision. You have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. You give the permits away for free, you auction them off, you have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. The CBO report indicates if you have a cap-and-trade system and you give away the permits for free, you have highly regressive effects. If you have a cap-and-trade system and you auction off some substantial share to all of the permits, then whether it's regressive, progressive, or neither of the above, sort of main, just kind of right in the middle, depends on what you do with the proceeds from those permits that you auction off. But the only way in which it's clearly regressive is if you either, if you give away a substantial share of the permits for free, it's clearly going to be regressive because you clearly won't have enough money to offset the regressivity, the regressivity that the increases in consumer prices alone would cause. As long as you auction off a substantial share of the permits, you have the potential to ensure that the system is not regressive. Uh, you can make it progressive if but, you want to. You can but, simply avoid the regressivity. But, but getting back to what Mayor Bloomberg told this committee last November in Seattle, you know, why not be honest? If, if, if we're going to increase energy costs, uh, to do this, why doesn't Congress directly levy a tax, which is the honest way of doing it, and that way members of Congress have to be accountable for their votes one way or the other, rather than simply folding the cost of this into energy bills and then Congress taking a bow for, quote, giving money away uh, to people that we decide need to get the money from the auction? Isn't Mayor Bloomberg right? In saying, let's be upfront and honest, rather than you know going through this tremendously bureaucratic system with all kinds of values of who deserves the money from the auction and who doesn't. There may be a different set of answers on the panel here. Let me quickly note, for starters, that your prior question: Is it regressive? Is it not regressive? The same question applies to a carbon tax. It would all depend on what you did with the proceeds. Yeah, I'm not for a carbon tax either. <laughs> now. As, as, as you know, um, the advantage of a cap and trade is you have a firm cap on emissions, mm -hmm. and the disadvantage is you don't know in advance the impact on the price. With the carbon tax, you have certainty on the price, uh, but uncertainty on the exact level of emissions reduction that you get. Uh, many economists, uh, including... Well, my, my time is up. You know, uh, Europe has had cap and trade, and uh, the amount of emissions has gone up. So my time is up. Thank you. Europe's failed. Don't need to copy them. Um, gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. One of the benefits of the uh, head in the sand attitude of this administration is that we have a chance to look at the experiences in other parts of the world as people were, are struggling with uh, how we're going to have a carbon constrained economy. Um, I, it's, uh, lots of things are not pollutants in the natural order. I mean, CO2 in its normal amounts is not salt, but if we get too much of a good thing, uh, we have real problems. And I appreciate our witnesses saying that these things are not mutually exclusive in terms of stimulating uh, the uh, economy by not taking it out of the economy. And everything I heard from the witnesses is you're thinking of this is not somehow something that is going to be shot into space uh, that's going to be circling the planet. This value is going to be reinvested somewhere. 
It's going to be a windfall in the hands of some. It's going to be targeted towards redevelopment. Um, I, Mr. Podesta, I'm not certain that, that I would use the Land and Water Conservation Fund as, a, as an example that gives me hope. I think we can learn from that experience as well. But you're suggesting that it's part of a comprehensive strategy. As I hinted at in my opening statement, what I'm interested uh, in your uh, observations about making it part of a comprehensive strategy that focuses on the two principal expenditures of American households, that, uh, both in terms of dollars and in terms of carbon, uh, housing and transportation. Um, uh, I would be interested in observations, uh, particularly from the right wing here, um, uh, on, the, on the panel, at least my right wing, in terms of how you think uh, we can best harness the value that could be created to help households with infrastructure uh, and energy conservation and transportation that would reduce their carbon footprint, stimulate the economy, and protect their economic security. Uh, well, let me begin. I think, I think the Congress, and again, I commend you, for, has already taken a giant step by increasing vehicle efficiency on, on the transportation side. Uh, there's obviously more investment to do in transportation, in smart growth, in, in some of the initiatives that, that uh, you've championed, uh, in uh, more mass transit spending, et cetera. And I think some of the proceeds of the auction uh, could, ought to go, should go and ought to go uh, to those kinds of investments. Uh, on the housing side, uh, I think you get at that through, again, through complementary policies uh, to the cap and trade, uh, better building codes, uh, a smart grid uh, investment in the electric infrastructure so that you could have real-time metering and, and basically begin to uh, do what's happened in California, which over the past 30 years uh, has kept its per capita energy consumption flat, uh, while the United States energy consumption has grown by 40 percent. Uh, while maintaining high levels of growth in the economy and high levels of wealth uh, in the state. So I think those complementary policies, and Mr. Bowles is trying to implement those in, in Massachusetts, uh, directly going at, uh, at the issues of, of uh, efficiency, building codes, that's where the low-hanging fruit is, uh, and we need to pay attention to that in addition to, the, uh, to creating the right kind of structure for the cap and trade. Mr. Bowles, you referenced um, the, uh, the trade-off in terms of the 1 percent uh, increase, 5 percent longer term savings in energy. Can, can you talk about how, uh, in a little more detail, how you think you can seize on that and make that sort of difference? Yeah, I mean, just the, the key point, and thank you for the question, is, and I would agree with everything John just said, um, that we have a tremendously inefficient and creaky electricity system in the United States. We need to upgrade transmission, we need real-time metering, and we need a hell of a lot more end-use efficiency. It is the lowest hanging fruit. So when Congress thinks about what should we be doing to use these auction proceeds, uh, I think a lot of the whole panel agrees that auctioning makes sense. Once you've got the proceeds, what do you do? How do you prioritize it? I would use the criteria of how can we save the most for consumers, low-income, middle class, uh, and how can we lock in the greatest environmental benefits? I think things like appliance standards, which Congress has moved forward on, vitally important. Building codes are at the state level. We in Massachusetts are joining the International uh, Energy Conservation Code, vitally important. Uh, so I think you can do a great deal of that. On the efficiency side, there's a tremendous amount of return. We did an economic analysis. In fact, it was done under the Romney administration. I'm happy to share it with the committee that showed the disproportionate returns that would come from allocating the auction proceeds uh, to energy efficiency. We could see savings above 5 percent in commercial, industrial, uh, and residential parts of the uh, electricity sector. So that is the lowest hanging fruit and I think the biggest opportunity for savings. The gentleman's uh, time has expired. Um, the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to thank all the panelists for being here today. I guess this question for anybody who wants to answer it, or, or as many of you that want to answer it, uh, what, certainty, what certainty do we have that any cap-and-trade program would achieve carbon target certainty? And also, with all the, the trading going on, where do you see the tangible reductions taking place? Anybody? Um, the second part first. Our modeling and modeling by the EIA suggests that over the first couple decades of a 
climate policy, although the electricity sector is responsible for about 40 percent of the CO2 emissions in the country, it's expected to account for two-thirds to three-quarters of the emission reductions that would be achieved. That's why there's so much attention given to the electricity sector. The other part of your question is how can we be sure that a cap would be obtained and not violated? Uh, that's been the predominant success of capped programs previously. The issues when there have been emission increases has been when the a cap was initially set at a level that was regrettable and not as tight as perhaps it, sh it could have or, or should have been. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, when, we des uh, when we designed our carbon market in Europe, we studied very carefully the experience in the U.S. The main thing to achieve the emission reductions is that they have a very credible and robust compliance and enforcement system. Uh, the price of a carbon allowance today in Europe is roughly 20 to 22 euros per ton of CO2. If you fail to surrender the emission allowance, there's a financial penalty levied on the company of 100 euros per ton of CO2. So that creates a very strong incentive to comply with the cap. And the reductions come not from the trading of the allowances, but comes from the carbon price signal that you create in the economy. So where you make it worthwhile you know, to, to innovate, to push forward on the technological front and bring the emissions down. I would just add, and thank you for the excellent question, that one of the benefits of auctioning is you have price discovery and you figure out what it is worth to have one of these allowances. If you just give them away, you don't have that information. So you can adjust your cap at the, at the federal level to say, are we hitting our target and do we need to send a louder price signal uh, into the economy? I think it's a real benefit of the cap uh, and the auction approach that you don't get necessarily from a carbon tax approach. Anyone else? How, how much time do I have left? The witnesses can take two, uh, two minutes and 23 seconds. Okay, you I got yield I, it back or ask. I've got question. one more question. I'll okay, ask please. Um, would you say that allowances and their prices should be set by Congress, um, the administration, or the market? What if the price of allowances skyrocket to an uns unsustainable level? What would be the backup plan? I guess you kind of talked about a little of that. Let me just comment quickly on what we've done in the regional greenhouse gas system. So uh, there are two different triggers uh, based on price that allow access to a larger market for offsets. So there's a large market for carbon offsets, which are uh, other ways to um, achieve greenhouse gas reduction. So it starts out in a New England market, then goes national and goes international based on price triggers. So as price goes up, you have an increasing pool of alternative ways to reach compliance. I don't know if that answers well, your question. Gentlemen from Oklahoma yield. Yes, I'll yield. Um, I was just advised that uh, the Times of London reported this morning that the United Kingdom, uh, under the new European system that Mr. Zopfel uh, described, would end up having to pay an additional six billion pounds or twelve billion dollars a year in order to comply with this. Now, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just wondering you know, what the hit on the British economy would be, which is an economy that is much smaller than the American economy with uh, this kind of a, a, essentially a bureaucratic hit. Maybe Mr. Zopfel can answer that. I cannot confirm the figures that you put forward. We have undertaken substantial evaluation for the EU overall. Uh, we come to the conclusion that our far-reaching climate and energy targets, so not just the reductions via the trading scheme overall, can be achieved at a fairly affordable cost of roughly half a percent of our GDP. All of this uh, needs to be compared well, to, to the figures. If the, if the gentleman will yield further, is a $12 billion hit on the economy of the United Kingdom is, is not insignificant. And this is what the, the largest and most respective newspaper in the United Kingdom uh, analyzed what you have just announced today. As it I ain't say, free. As I said, I cannot confirm those figures overall for the European economy overall. The, the, the costs are fairly insignificant. Uh, we also have to look at the costs of non-action, as has been outlined in the Stern report, which can be a lot more considerable than costs of bringing down our emissions. Maybe let me also use the occasion, because you said there is, uh, there, no emissions have been reduced. Uh, in the f there is some research. Uh, this, your statement refers to the first period, the first trading period, 2005 to 2007, which was for us in Europe a learning period. We didn't have the benefit, as you have in the U.S., with air pollutant trading programs, sulfur and nitrogen trading programs. So we started from scratch in Europe. 
our emissions cap was not binding in 2005 to 2007, but also we do not have our Kyoto commitments kicking in 2005 to 2007. We brought down the emissions cap for the trading scheme in the second phase already by 10% compared to the first phase, which makes sure that we will see emission reductions in the second phase. And as I said in my, in my, in my introductory statement before, this emissions cap will come down by another 11% so that we are 21% below 2005 emissions by the year 2020, which guarantees emission reductions and the environmental integrity of the European carbon market. The uh, gentleman's time has expired, and the Chair will recognize the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think Mr. Greenstein mentioned that some had argued that this would be corporate welfare if you don't have an auction system, and I, I just want to ask about the logic of that. Going back to this issue, the, the tragedy of the commons, my understanding is that people who argue that essentially say, look, this is an asset. There's a scarce an asset, the, the, the atmosphere only has a limited carrying capacity for CO2, and if we're going to give rights away to people to pollute that, you're giving away a scarce asset. It has an economic value, and therefore it would be a sense of welfare of giving away a public asset for free. It would be like giving away gold from our, from our uh, national parks or the like. Is, is that the logic, and does an auction solve that problem? Well, an auction does solve that problem, but you don't have to go to that logic to reach the corporate welfare conclusion. And the term isn't mine, although I would agree with it. Uh, what's interesting is the corporate welfare term in this context actually is Greg Mankiw's term. He is a leading conservative Republican economist at Harvard. He was the chair of President George W. Bush's Council of Economic Advisors. What Mankiw is saying, you don't even have to go to the commons thing to get there. What Mankiw is saying is, look, if in a cap and trade system you give to energy companies and other emitters allowances that exceed in value the increased costs they'll incur under the new system, then you're giving them a form of welfare. If you, it's one thing if you simply offset the increased costs they'll incur. But if you go beyond that and you just give them these permits, which they can sell for billions of dollars, above and beyond what's needed to offset their costs, that's corporate welfare. That's what CBO is essentially saying as well. CBO's term is windfall profits. Mancuse is corporate welfare. Uh, it's simply saying you give them more than they need to offset their costs. You're, you're giving away billions of dollars in gain to these companies and their shareholders. Uh, that's clearly a, a form of windfall. I appreciate that. Mr. Podesta, I really appreciate your basically saying that environmental policy in this case isn't economic policy. It's a, it's a view I share. Uh, and I want to let you know you're not alone. Um, I was just looking at a report from McKinsey and Company. It just came out in December. And they concluded uh, that almost 40 percent of abatement could be achieved at negative marginal costs. In other words, 40 percent of your savings of CO2, you'd actually reduce your costs. It'd actually be a profit margin for the U.S. economy, if you will. And it, and it talked about the barriers to achieving those 40 percent improvements uh, are principal capital uh, accumulation to do the work, the rehabbing your house, the acquisition of new heating and cooling system, more efficient cars, the whole nine yards. I just wonder if you give any, any more thoughts about how we could fence off the revenues from a, from a cap-and-trade system to be used for the legitimate purposes of that, both R&D, uh, help to consumers to weatherize their homes, help to them to uh, obtain new e efficient equipment. What's the best way to do it? I know you give us some ideas, but what's the best way in the real life to do that? Well, <clears throat> as, I, as I said, and I, uh, maybe provide some more information for the, for the record, uh, Mr. Inslee, I think that, that uh, creating accounts in which the the uh, the Congress decides where that money is going to go, uh, either by uh, allocating permits to it or taking the uh, as we, uh, which is the approach taken in uh, uh, in the new Lieberman Warner bill, or by auctioning 100 percent of the permits, which is our preferred approach, segregating that money and making those important investments, but ensuring that that money is available either through tax credits, which, uh, again, the, 
the uh, uh, we hope to see, I think, the production tax credits reauthorized in, in, uh, in this session of Congress uh, on, uh, on renewable energy or through uh, direct uh, investments that could be operated either through the states or directly uh, is the best way to take, uh, again, a, a good chunk of that money and apply it uh, to, the, to the very real challenge. The other uh, place that we would spend some money is on innovation itself. Uh, into, into boosting the R&D portfolio of the United States. We've seen enormous returns of investment uh, in, the, in the past, particularly uh, at DARPA and the DOD programs. But if you think about the information technology revolution driven by federal investment at the front end, I think you can, you can imagine at least an energy innovation uh, and virtuous cycle driven uh, by investment at the federal level into these new technologies. You see a lot of uh, uh, venture capital pouring into that, uh, into that arena right now, but I think if you had the right kind of uh, investment portfolio from the federal government, that would, that would uh, really quicken the change that, that we need. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Podesta, you laid out in your testimony how the revenue from a cap and trade scheme based on, on auction might be equitably distributed. Uh, I think that's a terrific uh, approach. Uh, can you recap how your proposal uh, and then comment on how free giveaway of the cap and trade system would distribute revenue? Well, I think that, uh, you know, again, we've had the your exper European experience described here the, the, uh, this morning, I think, uh, to going to the second part of the question. I think if you have a free giveaway uh, with uh, and, and no allocation of, uh, no auction, no allocation of revenue, what's likely to happen is uh, rates will go up, uh, the, the uh, uh, generating companies will pocket the money, their, their, uh, uh, shareholders would do very well, and, and, and the people at the other end will do very badly. So I, we, we support the kinds of uh, proposals that Mr. Greenspan, Mr. Greenstein was, uh, I, uh, he's, he's, liberal, <laughs> he's still a liberal, uh, Mr. Greenstein was talking about taking 45 percent of the auction uh, share and rebating that to people either directly through the tax code uh, or for particularly for low-income people where that mechanism doesn't work very well uh, to do it through other kinds of income supports, uh, which, which Bob, of course, is the expert on, uh, and then taking 45 percent, making these public investments that I described. And then it, we, we also recognize that, uh, and I think that uh, the work that CBO has done uh, suggests that 10 to 15 percent uh, of, uh, of the revenue might go to companies and communities, particularly hard hit, uh, by put by increasing the cost of production of energy, I th I'm thinking here particularly uh, in places hard hit by uh, that are coal producing and those kind of uh, of arena. Uh, the CBO estimates that that looks like to be about 10 per 10 to 15 percent of the revenue. So we would say put that back into those communities, help them uh, weather the transition to a new economy. Can I add one quick point on that? <clears throat> there have been questions mm. from several members to John on. Uh, how do you make sure the money actually goes for these purposes and there's been discussion of trust funds and the like. I think we need to separate out <clears throat> the discretionary part of the budget, the appropriated part, from the other parts, entitlements, taxes and so forth. You would need some kind of trust fund mechanism like that for the discretionary part. Uh, you wouldn't, and I wouldn't recommend it, for the consumer relief part. If you're giving part of the consumer relief through uh, an expansion in the earned income tax credit or a new tax credit such as Mr. Larson has in his bill uh, that's based on uh, the, the first certain amount of the payroll tax that's paid. Uh, we, we don't have anything in the tax code where the IRS has to look each year at how much money is in a particular trust fund and make the tax credit go up and down every year. You just do the tax credit. You work with CBO and the Joint Tax Committee. You have an estimate of how much revenue is going to come in from the auctioning of the proceeds. You design the appropriate tax credits that you need. Uh, you make sure the scores all fit and you go forward. So trust fund thing would be needed for the discretionary part, for the tax part and the direct spending part. You need some direct spending for the low income people, as John mentioned. Uh, you just write that into the cap and trade bill and you go forward. 
Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Bowles, in a state like Massachusetts uh, and also in California, we're starting to see the effects of REGI and AB uh, 32. Uh, do you have any specific recommendations in terms of how to make sure that the federal programs complement those instead of uh, the, uh, what other possibilities there are? Thank you for the excellent question. One thing I just would try to underscore for this whole discussion is a lot of the cost negative items that Mr. Inslee mentioned from the McKinsey report, which I commend to the committee to read, are really implemented by the states. Things like building codes, energy efficiency, building renewable power plants, zoning smart growth, a lot of the easy stuff we need to do is going to be implemented by the states. So I would really encourage the committee and the Congress to look at giving financial incentives with some of those auction proceeds to say, if you state are doing uh, all those things, plus rate decoupling, maximizing efficiency, then we're going to support you. You need to create some incentive because the states are the units that regulate the utilities and have such a big role where a lot of the easy things are going to be uh, done first. Back to your, to, your, to your broader question, I mean, look, I think the Congress could do us in California and 17 other states a great favor by, you know, making sure EPA got out of the way on the, the CalLev standard. It's vitally important, goes beyond uh, what, uh, what the CAFE increase, which is terrific, um, does. Obviously, the, we're seeking uh, EPA implementation of uh, uh, the Mass versus EPA case on uh, Clean Air Act. And so I think there's a lot of things that the Bush administration could do to get out of the way of states like Massachusetts uh, and California. But thank you for the question. Thank you. I yield. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from South Dakota, Ms. Herseth Sandler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank all of our witnesses today for helping uh, illuminate further the, and acknowledging and helping quantify what costs may be associated uh, with making this transition, but also identifying the economic opportunities uh, that exist and ensuring that we don't ignore the fact that there are costs to inaction. Uh, I do want to describe sort of a set of circumstances, though, as it relates to uh, the part of the country that I represent, uh, the Great Plains and rural America, and just get your thoughts if you could comment on uh, if we do move to uh, cap and trade and as we discuss the issue of um, free allocations versus auctions and then reinvesting and recycling the revenue, uh, just to get your thoughts on whether or not we, we phase this in uh, and give time to adapt, as Mr. Zatfeld described, or if we move to something more 100% uh, auction nearly immediate within what we set up, because I have con some concerns about that in light of, of the circumstances present in, say, South Dakota. Uh, on the positive side uh, of cap and trade for South Dakota, I see greater incentives to develop our wind resources, greater incentives to develop solar resources throughout our area and, and the southeast and other regions, reinvestment in our hydroelectric facilities, uh, the investment for carbon cap and tr or excuse me, uh, carbon capture and sequestration, uh, because we are a very heavily coal dependent region of the country. Uh, there are also economic opportunities here for agriculture as it relates to certain farming and grazing practices as carbon storage and transitioning to integrating new uh, technologies for cleaner burning coal in our coal-fired facilities that service our rural electric cooperatives. But that is sort of the difficult side here of cap and trade, is that when you have rural electric cooperatives, you have rural consumers, you have very poor consumers in certain parts of the Great Plains that live on Native American reservations, when we're still working to develop the transmission that some of you talked about, the need to sort of reinvest in the infrastructure of our transmission capacity for wind, time to measure just precisely in the, car the Chicago Climate Exchange is trying to do this for agriculture. Uh, it seems to me that we need a little time to adapt. And that's why I, I think that, at least for now, I sort of favor more of a phase-in approach uh, rather than something that's nearly a 100 percent auction immediately within the system. So if you could comment on that, and then Mr. Zatfeld, if you could also comment on um, perhaps, as you described, maybe an initial misjudgment in the European system being that they were free allocations versus an auction, and now you're making that transition. But I understand that agriculture, uh, that you chose not to uh, help measure, quantify and measure for agriculture to participate in the cap and trade system in Europe, and if you could comment on that. 
Could I make a comment on the phase-in issue? Um, we, we should note that under all the bills, there is a major phase-in in the sense that the emissions reduction target is a small amount of re emissions reduction initially, and that phases in very gradually over a number of decades. That, that, that's the major phase in. With regard to the permits, one could do something where you give away a large share of the permits for free initially and then phase that down. The Lieberman-Warner bill, I think, gives away 40 percent or more of the permits for free initially, and on paper it eventually phases it to zero. My concern is the politics being what they are, and the power of the companies being what they are. Uh, I believe that if Lieberman Warner were enacted, we would never get to zero. That Congress would come back and change the law uh, well before we got to zero, and that we could end up getting stuck permanently at too high a level. So that doesn't mean you couldn't do any phasing at all, but I think the notion of starting uh, with, I don't know, more than 15 or 20 percent of the permits being given away, starting with any higher percentage and just assuming you're phasing it way down, uh, I think is dangerous. I think it risks the potential that before the phase down occurs, companies get the law changed, and then the various purposes for which you thought you had money, such as a number of the things you just mentioned, can't get the resources to be funded. I'd like to just add, uh, the phase-in in terms of the changes in electricity prices is going to be immediate. So the program can be put in place and you can talk about allocation in different ways, but you're going to see an immediate change in product prices. So there is no phase-in to talk about except in some portions of the country in the electricity sector where there's two alternatives. In those regions of the country where there is regulated prices, then a free allocation to firms will get passed through to consumers and soften the blow initially. But the problem is that that treats the country in a very asymmetric way because you have roughly half the country under cost of service and half the country in, with competitive electricity markets. I think that's inviting a new civil war. <laughs> so the, so uh, an approach that has emerged recently that has uh, surprising support from very disparate companies would be free allocation to load serving entities. These are the retail electricity companies that deliver electricity services directly to customers. And they could be expected to pass through to customers the value of the emission allowances. So this has a politically attractive appeal that it would keep electricity prices low and would look like a phase in as we enter the new constrained carbon regime. The problem, as other speakers have already mentioned, is this constitutes essentially a subsidy to electricity consumption that you don't get for natural gas or transportation fuels or to industry and commerce. And so to put this in place, to enshrine this, would dramatically raise the costs of carbon policy nationally. We don't want to get our feet stuck in cement there. So if you want to look for a phase in, allocation to load as is a component of the Lieberman-Warner bill is a, is a reasonable play, way to start, but I would urge you to think about that as a rapid transition to a, a full auction. And, uh, and, and recognize coming from the, the Great Plains, you know, this, this creation of this $350 billion a year in intangible property right is analogous, the last time we saw this in American history was the assignment of property rights in the Great American West because this is going to be on a recurring annual basis. This is an enormous new property right, and the question is to whom will it accrue over the rest of the century? And that's, that's why the auction is such an important question. And, and the gentlelady's time has expired, but could you, Mr. Zaffel, deal with this issue of how Europe is treating the agricultural sector? I think it's important for us to hear that. Yes, uh, it's a pleasure to do so. Uh, our carbon market is not, as, as it is discussed here, an economy-wide program. We see the carbon market as one of the essential elements of bringing down our emissions. We have reviewed now whether we should include uh, credits from agriculture and forestry, but we remain of the opinion that for the time being they should stay outside of our carbon trading mechanism for mainly two reasons. First of all, we need high quality, high quality monitoring reporting of the emissions, which we do not see we can do yet in those sectors. And secondly, we also haven't been able to address the questions of permanency and leakage yet, especially in the forest sector. If you grow new forests, but at the same time in other places you cut down forests, so the permanence and the leakage is important. We uh, have a very, uh, as Mr. Sensenbrenner has, as Congressman Sensenbrenner has pointed out, the environmental integrity of the carbon market, delivering emission reductions is essential also for the public. So for that reason, we have proposed that uh, agricultural and forestry sink credits uh, stay out of the system. 
uh, up to 2020. Great. General lady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for putting together this uh, incredible uh, panel. And uh, it's uh, with a certain amount of trepidation that I go forward with my questioning, knowing uh, the vast amount of work that you have done and my good friend and colleague Jay Inslee have done with, with cap and trade. My only regret is that you didn't have polar bears here today so that we could have more of uh, the press here on such a weighty issue of discussion of the, uh, of the uh, cap and trade system uh, versus something that uh, I think still needs to be uh, pursued in terms of dialogue and discussion in terms of a uh, carbon tax. Now, I say that and I want to thank Mr. Podesta because I thought he started off and framed this in the appropriate way. We're in a crisis. Uh, and this crisis has to be solved and it has to be solved now. Um, the inconvenient truth is that, uh, as you heard our good colleague um, from Wisconsin say, is that, well, the most direct and straightforward, transparent way to deal with this, of course, would be for a carbon tax. Uh, but he said, but of course, he wouldn't be for that. And uh, uh, neither uh, would a lot of colleagues because of the anathema attached to taxes. And of course, we have an aversion to taxes in this country. For example, we fund a war. Or, well, we don't fund the war with taxes. We go into debt with a, with a war and tell the American people that it's being paid for. Uh, so I believe that uh, the choices are difficult and they become more clear. And I thank Mr. Uh, Greenstein also for, I think, illuminating the choices that we face here. Uh, one that deals with the certainty of emissions, the other with the certainty of price. Uh, I come down on the side of the certainty of price. I am proud to have initiated legislation along with Mr. Blumenauer and Mr. Miller, but pretty much follows what Vice President Gore and, my God, if we can get Vice President Gore and the President of the Chamber of Commerce to agree that this is a way that we should go in terms of a carbon tax and that it should have to offset the mitigating factors and the regressivity of it, a direct payroll reduction that corresponds in it so that you can get down the road relief for people that actually need it, then I think we've, we've got something. Notwithstanding, I am interested in this whole auctioning thing. I, I have to say, I have to give this the Augie and Ray's test. Now, most of you don't know what Augie and Ray's is. It's a little Hamburg hot dog joint in East Hartford where most of the people that I know gather. But they're pretty down to earth, you know, and they read pretty, people pretty well, debate the Red Sox and the Yankees, yada, yada, yada. But here's the deal. You say auction into them, and they're looking at me like I'm on Mars. And I gotta be honest, how would it work? Who administers it? Uh, doesn't Mr. Greenstein and even Mr. Sensenbrenner make some sense when they say, isn't there a more direct, specific, easier way for us to administer something, albeit it may be a tax? And uh, uh, how is this all going to transpire? This is not going to be, and I heard Mr. Greenstein talk about the Lieberman-Warner bill. Geez, is this a, is this a uh, hedge fund windfall? How would this be administered? How do the proponents of this see this auction actually taking place. Who controls it? Who sets up the auction? Who's purchasing? What's going on here? Mr. Balls, thank you. Let me, let me just comment from our experience in New England, Connecticut, being a, uh, an important member of the, of the Reggie process. Um, the easiest thing to do is what we're doing first, which is power generation only. Covered plants in, in the Reggie footprint are 25 megawatts and up. They bid into the ISO every day with their, uh, uh, into the bid stack to figure out whether they're going to dispatch power or not. So they do it every day. They know how to do it. It's not complicated. All we have to do to set up the auction process is get one of the auction vendors in the Reggie uh, organization. What's an auction vendor? Auction vendors, uh, folks who run the Knox program, uh, people who administer or any number of other auctions. So you can see my problem here. Yeah, yeah, you say I'm auction vendor, I, you say runs the Knox program. I could see, that, I would say the Knox program at Augie's, they'd be saying, you talking about the Sox or the Knox? What are you talking about here? <laughs> I guess all I'm suggesting to you is that... Um, You're doing a very good job, by the way. I'm, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I'm trying to make a point here about 
how this all takes place. Continue, please, Mr. Bolton. I, I was just going to say, I think the answer to your voters is to simply say power generators do this every day. Nothing much changes um, except that we're going to make them pay for this little thing to help protect the environment, uh, and we're going to find a way to pass that back into more savings for you. Because like Massachusetts, Connecticut is also just passing least cost procurement through legislature, and there's going to be a, a bunch of savings available. So I guess I would say in the power sector it's quite simple, and it happens today. I think it is more complicated as you move into other sectors, particularly to explain. But thank you for the question. Mr. Greenstein? I, I don't think the big complexity is it, administering the auction. You know, we had, we had auctions of the electromagnetic spectrum. The FCC administered that. <coughs> we could establish a new federal agency to run the auctions. Um, I do. Would that wanna, be a more efficient way to do this? No, I do, I do want to say that all else being equal, uh, I would prefer a carbon tax to a cap and trade. Having said that, I don't want to let the perfect uh, be the enemy of the good. Uh, I'm not sure you could pass a carbon tax. I think you'd be more likely able to pass a cap and trade than a carbon tax. And if you have a cap and trade with an auction, what that auction really does is to make the cap and trade more like a carbon tax, not fully, just partly. I mean, if you can pass a carbon tax, more power to you. But I think part of how we got here is the sense that that would be hard to pass. Gentlemen, thank you. Inspired. I think if we could pass a carbon tax, it would probably be uh, less power to us subsequently. But uh, <laughs> I think that's a lesson that we've learned. Uh, the chair um, recognizes the uh, gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the witnesses. Um, uh, I think part of what needs to happen is, as you are educating us, we need to go out to our constituents and to the country and help to educate them so that they will understand that the corner store or you know, the deli that I go to in my district, uh, when people talk about a carbon tax versus a cap and trade, to help them understand what that is. And it's, it's not, as you say, uh, given the, uh, the knocks and socks and the, the, you know, the successful uh, change in uh, chlorofluorocarbons uh, that was wrought by a similar uh, kind of governmental uh, process. This is proven ground. I also come from a place, myself, a moral place and a philosophical place that says that there is, there should be, and there exists an implicit uh, environmental bill of rights. And that every one of us, every child born on this planet has a right to breathe clean air and to have clean water to drink and unsoiled uh, soil to for their food to be grown in. And so I object to the idea that, oh, we're interfering with business. We just somehow, we got way ahead of ourselves and polluted the planet and the ecosystem to the point where we're not only dealing with or trying to deal with climate change, but we're also suffering from asthma epidemics and emphysema epidemics in our inner cities, especially among our children. And last summer, across the entire state of New York, uh, there were a number of days when we had uh, dangerous air quality alerts in rural parts of the, of the state where you wouldn't expect that. And it's because of the uh, pollution moving from other power plants in the Midwest or wherever across state lines. And, and so by trying to deal with greenhouse gas emissions, we will also be dealing with our dependency on foreign sources of oil, our balance, balance of trade deficit, uh, creating new jobs and new industries and new technologies here, uh, making ourselves more uh, independent, keeping our sovereignty and not having to fight wars in unstable parts of the world, et cetera, et cetera. So there's so many, it's a win-win-win thing we're talking about. Cap and trade is only one small aspect of it. Uh, so having made that little bit of a speech, I want to ask uh, uh, Secretary Bowles uh, in particular, I'm interested in um, the idea that efficiency seems to be endorsed unanimously as one of the most effective and immediate steps we can take to cut greenhouse gases and our power bills. Uh, but under the current system, it's counterintuitive for utilities to pitch in since they make their money by selling power. In your testimony, you reference efforts to decouple sales from revenue. Uh, could you elaborate on those efforts and what types of investments we could make with auction revenues or allowance incentives that we could use to bridge the gap? 
Uh, thank you for the excellent question, and thank you for your um, statement. I uh, very well said at the at the beginning. I would agree. Um, uh, New York State just did a rate decoupling, as I'm sure you know. The public utility commissions of the states regulate utilities. They've got a, a history of rate making that is, by and large, tied to volumetric sales of power, whether or not those utilities own the power generation or not. So, in the half of the country is. Dallas mentioned that has a deregulated power system, uh, New York and Massachusetts uh, and all of New England. Uh, our utilities don't own the power generators. Uh, they own just the wires. So they bring it to your house uh, and the power generators own, the, own, own power generation. So we have inherited a system in the past where it made sense to measure rate recovery for the utilities based on the volumetric sales. It seems like a, a simple thing. Instead, the criteria should be on performance and reliability, outages, things like that, least cost service. So making sure that the utilities um, are bringing uh, good power uh, and reliable power to your doorstep, but not incenting them or discouraging them on the volume of power uh, that they sell. And that's really the, neck, the, the crux of rate decoupling, is severing that link, that manifest economic incentive that says to the utilities, maximize power sales in order to maximize revenue for your, for your shareholders. Instead, we need the utilities to be indifferent or, in fact, incented on a performance basis to be partners um, in energy conservation. I think the utilities, uh, New York's got a terrific <coughs> model with NYSERDA. Uh, in different states, the utilities, such as Massachusetts, actually run the efficiency programs. Uh, and that's a good thing because they're very close to their partners, but they need the type of oversight to make sure their spending is done well. So I think a federal incentive in terms of uh, conditioning some of the auction proceeds back to states who have done decoupling and done uh, lease cost procurement, things of that nature, really makes a ton of sense for getting that low-hanging fruit. Thank you for the question. Very briefly, the same applies to the natural gas market as well. Thank you. Um, and the next question I have is, uh, how directly do you think we should try to, I guess I'm, I'm done. No, uh, you will ask one more. Okay, I'll ask my last question. What would you think of uh, Mr. Podesta, for starters, uh, for instance, a proposal uh, to target auction revenue by uh, using the sales of um, uh, credits from power plants to do something like helping car companies to put electric vehicles into mass production or to build alternative fuel infrastructure? Well, I think that that uh, again, that's that's exactly the kind of incentives that you that you want to uh, uh, encourage. That not only helps to go back to your opening statement. That on, not only helps on the overall uh, uh, CO2 problem and the global warming problem, uh, but I think if we can move the transportation fleet more onto the electric grid through uh, uh, plug-in hybrids and other and other types of new generation of vehicles, uh, you've also uh, dealt with the oil security problem, which is a very you know it's another uh, pressing problem that the United States faces, both from a balance of trade perspective, but most most importantly, I think from the sources of oil that are uh, and and where that money is actually flowing to. Uh, in the United States. So I think that uh, that is important, and I think that the, the, uh, some of those proceeds, and we would recommend that some of those proceeds go uh, to the U.S. auto companies uh, in, the, in the form of, of tax rebates to retool to get onto this new generation of vehicles that uh, either through plug-in hybrids or uh, as General Motors is moving towards a slightly different platform with the Chevy Volt. Thank you very much. I yield back. Gentlemen's, you, gentlemen's you, time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. And um, I think there is going to be a roll call coming up in just a very little bit up on the House floor. But uh, if each member for a second round would like to have two minutes to ask if they have one compelling question, we can recognize them for a second round. We'll, on the first round, to complete the first round, we'll uh, recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize. I was later. We have had, had another committee hearing, and I, I only have two questions. Um, and I guess I should preface it by saying I'm, I support either cap and trade or carbon tax, um, either way. Uh, but but I'm going to take a little negative uh, slant here, uh, and, I, and I hope this hasn't already surfaced. Uh, when I was mayor of, of Kansas City, we had um, a, a municipal uh, ordinance uh, that. Um, would allow us to fine uh, slum landlords $2,000 each time their uh, property was cited uh, as violating the city code. And we discovered after uh, uh, about five years that there were some landlords who actually built in uh, the fines into the cost of doing business. And, you know, because you're not going to get caught every month or every other month. 
and so they just built it in. What happens if there are uh, power plants or, uh, uh, or, or entities participating in the program uh, from just uh, placing the cost uh, of, of polluting into what they spend to do business? Uh, you know, and, and, and they get, you know, it's not a matter of stopping, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, I'm going to pay the cost. I guess I just would say that I think that really summarizes the argument for auctioning instead of allowances because the utility, the power generators will charge their customers for the economic value of that permit because they can sell it to someone else or they can expend it uh, when they run or they can save it for the future. So I would say that concern um, is best addressed through having an auction where there's a, a clear, transparent understanding of what the value is uh, and then you also have the revenue that you can go back to help out um, low income. Uh, energy uh, consumers uh, to, to get control of their own energy bill through things like energy efficiency, but others may have answers as well. I, I would add that, you know, the whole purpose of the cap and trade system is really to raise prices, in a sense, for fossil fuel energy and create the incentive for private actors in the market, companies and consumers, to switch to cleaner, more efficient forms of fuel. In fact, I, I, I think what, so the, to the degree that a company keeps prices higher, uh, putting all of this in, then whether it's wind and solar or all sorts of other forms of alternative energy that may not be that economically attractive now, they become very economically attractive uh, because they become cheaper. One other quick point on that is when you're thinking about how to use the proceeds, Certain things that can't happen now without government subsidies in the energy sector no longer need government subsidies under a cap and trade because the price point has changed. And in fact, listening to the discussion this morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, I start to become a little concerned and I, I would offer a caution. Uh, when you design the legislation, make sure you don't squander some of the proceeds on efficiency incentives that the government isn't needed for anymore, that the market itself will drive as a result of the changes in prices that the cap and trade will come about. I'm not saying you don't need any energy efficiency uh, subsidies, but I think you would may need less than you think you would need if the cap and trade works the way it's supposed to. Uh, thank you. Actually, you answered my second question, uh, Mr. Greenstein. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Burchard, do you want to respond to Mr. Cleaver? Yes, sir. Uh, I just want to point out that in, for fossil fuel consumption in the electricity sector, there's in place continuous emission monitors. They, they record on a 15-minute basis the uh, emissions from a power plant. So this is electronically reported. And then also major fuel users report to the EIA their fuel use. And it's fairly transparent to calculate the carbon content of fuels that are being used. So that's one fortunate aspect of this problem is that with a certain, and a lesson we've learned from that sulfur dioxide trading program, with certain penalties in place, you're going to, you can expect to achieve virtually 100 percent compliance under this program. A gentleman's time has expired. Now we'll go to a lightning round here, give uh, members, if they want, uh, two minutes to ask uh, any follow-up questions they would like to make. Uh, Chair, recognize the gentleman from Washington State. Thank you. We went to Europe last summer and looked at the cap-and-trade experience, and it was described to me as, as um, a great scandal, the situation where there was an allocation without auction, and then there were windfall profits in the billions of dollars taken by utilities in Europe and consumers in Europe were outraged by this when they found out they had been gamed by this system, that this asset had been given to the utilities, and then they turned around and put it in the rate base and charged the consumers the implicit value of not selling the asset. And they said not selling the asset was a cost to the utility, which then they turned around and, and sent right to the consumers. So what I was hearing from Europe is that that giveaway system turned out to be a scandalous affair, and I presume is one of the things that's driving the move now towards more of auction. I just wonder, Mr. Zapfel, if you could comment on that, or was I reading that situation correctly? And then I want to ask Mr. Bertrow, to what extent could that be replicated in the United States? 
Thank you, Congressman. I would not go as far as, as considering it as a scandal, but I think what we have learned in practice is that the same thing happens that, uh, for example, Mr. Bertrand's research would show, even if you give away the allowances for free in some sectors, it's very easy to pass them on in the prices. Uh, so this, this, this uh, conceptual uh, effect has very much proven to be so also in practice. And this is, as, as I've said already in my introductory statement, one of the main motivating factors uh, that we move over to auctioning now. So I would not see this as, a, as we had initially this perception in Europe that our, our mechanism is fading because this is happen happening. But now as we go ahead and as more and more people look into this and, and, and research this, say this is a, a demonstrating that the carbon market is in fact functioning, that price signal is created, and that price signal works itself through the economy and the efficiency advantages of the carbon market can be realized in practice. What we talk about with, the, with, with uh, allocating allowances is a distributional effect. And where in society do you want to put the distributional effect? Do you want to give it to the tax pay in the first place, or do you want to give it to the shareholders of the power company? Yes, sir. To a, to a first order, we would estimate that the change in product prices will not depend on how that allocation occurs. So, you're going, so the, if you're giving away this valuable asset to firms, that is a transfer that is a form of compensation. But there, there's a second form of compensation they receive, which is the changes in revenues, the changes in product prices. And this opens the possibility for potentially dramatic overcompensation or what people have called windfall profits. So the same thing uh, I would expect to occur in the U.S as was observed in the EU if there was a um, free allocation of emission allowances to generators or to emitters throughout the economy generally. Okay. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Podesta, you would like to respond. I actually, <laughs> I would just like to disagree with my friend Mr. Greenstein for a second. Uh, I think the chances of the Congress over-investing in public goods is small. Uh, and I think that the, the amount of money that we're talking about to, to uh, uh, incentivize states to decouple rates, to uh, do home weatherization, to uh, add the kind of an efficiency boost in the early days of this, I, I think would be money well spent uh, and would be, uh, again, creates a virtuous cycle of uh, efficiency, productivity in the economy uh, and, and job creation. Uh, and so I wouldn't worry just about the price. I think so, sort of applying some of that revenue against, those uh, against that efficiency portfolio would be a very good thing for, the, for you to do as you design this cap and trade. Mr. Greenstein, 20-second rebuttal. I'm, I'm all for weatherization. I think when you write this bill, you will be besieged by various industries and interests promoting all sorts of subsidies and tax credits that are billed as green and pro-efficiency, and a substantial share of them will not be necessary. The market signal will do it. And if you give in to them, you won't have enough money for other key things like consumer needs. Uh, gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, two minutes. Thank you. Well, one of the uh, auctioning schemes I'm aware of starts with the first year of the auction giving out permits equal to the amount of carbon produced in the prior year, and then uh, reducing that level by a percent or two per year uh, until over a 30-year period you've reached your long-term goals. Now, that would allow businesses to plan ahead for, for auctioning price increases and so on. Uh, is there another scheme that makes more sense than that, or is that basically what you're advocating, uh, whoever would care? Uh, Mr. Greenstein? I'm sorry, you're we're, clearly everyone is talking about phasing in the um, <clears throat> tightening the cap over time. I think that's the key. No one's talking about having uh, going to, say, a 50 percent emissions reduction in 10 or 15 years. The, the key, I think, is to have that emissions cap gradually tighten over an extended period of time, have people know where that <coughs> cap is going over an extended period of time. And, and that's the key thing, I think, for the planning uh, for the future. Uh, uh, the old McCain-Lieberman bill stair-stepped down the uh, – had more dramatic reductions at a stair-step level. But I think that a, a, a phased uh, reduction is a more sensible way. It's easier to plan. Uh, it will permit you to hit your target and, and, uh, and, again, get the pollution savings that are necessary. But I think the most important issue at the end of the day is what you're trying to get to. Uh, and and I, I would say Europe has, has uh, uh, adopted the target of hitting uh, two degrees uh, centigrade rise in temperature above pre-industrial level by 2050. That's, I think, an appropriate target and sort of 
creating the the uh, the uh, curve to get you to that point in 2050 with early action uh, in between now and 2020 and 2025 is is really critical. Can, can I just comment on that, uh, Mr. Chairman? Just to say, I draw a distinction between a phase in of a cap versus a phase in of auction versus allowance. I think a weakness, to my mind, of some of the Senate bills is the phasing in of, of auctioning. Um, I think uh, an allowance, I mean, an auction process is manifestly superior in terms of returning benefits to the ratepayer and consumer. I think phasing in the cap, of course, makes sense. I fully okay. agree with Gentlemen. that. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady lady from South Dakota. Okay, let me pursue that a little bit further because I know you, you think, and, and to a degree I agree with you, the auction is the way to level the playing field. But there are certain regions of the country that start out at a disadvantage. And I am very concerned, Mr. Podesta, if you could respond to this, because as you laid out how you see the percentages of how you allocate the revenue, I don't see sufficient revenue there to dramatically improve our transmission capacity. So when I'm in South Dakota and we're dealing with the Western Area Power Administration of the West and the Midwest Independent System Operator to the East, and we've got all this wind that we can't get out that would benefit the electricity providers and other businesses in South Dakota, I mean, I, I would be more willing to uh, identify it as a weakness in terms of the phasing of the auction if we did, if there was some combination of the investment in the infrastructure with a cap and trade. And so, if you could comment on that. Well, I think I think the again, that's it's the, there are two different issues in, 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 in involved with that. We apply 10 percent to try to uh, incur to, to soften the blow, if you will, on communities that are particularly affected. You know, you could argue it's 15 percent, but it's probably not much more than that. There's a second question, which is, d d does uh, giving away the auction permits actually result in the, in the investment, or does auctioning the permits and then having the money available to make those investments, which is the better system? I think the people on the panel all think that a more transparent system is auction the permits and then use the proceeds of the permits uh, to upgrade the grid make the R&D investments, et cetera. And I don't think I disagree with you on that. My concern is the 100 percent auction at the outset. I mean, I'm looking at it as building in some time, and maybe the weakness of the Senate bills is they build in too much time. They start right. too low. But you can understand my concern about sure. almost I, I think that, that if you're going to move in that direction, though, you also may want a, a condition what those permits are being granted for with respect to the uh, reinvestment, uh, for example, in the, in the utility, in the, in the grid upgrade, so that they're not just being passed back uh, as a sort of Benny, as was the European experience that Mr. Inslee described to the, to, uh, you know, uh, I I in a larger sense to the shareholders of those companies. Okay. Okay, gentle, uh, gentle ladies, time has expired. Uh, gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the last two years, I guess the, the people who are uh, in the northeast area uh, of our country have been very, very pleased uh, because there's been a 10% uh, uh, reduction in uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but not because of any intentionality on the part of power plants. Uh, the weather has been mild. And as a result of the weather being mild and there's a 10% uh, uh, decrease in emissions, isn't that, uh, I mean, isn't that dangerous uh, if we're, when we're talking about trying to uh, create incentives for people to uh, reduce their emissions? I mean, um, what if the uh, cap is above, maybe, maybe too high above the emissions? Uh, I mean, do, doesn't that just have a negative impact? I would just comment. And how do we handle it? To, to say that uh, um, that's an argument for multi-year compliance periods because you do have weather events and you've got increases and decreases in uh, um, uh, in uh, energy use dur during that. So I say the long the regional greenhouse gas initiative is a three-year compliance period. We also in our trading scheme have unlimited banking uh, going forward. So if you buy a permit, you can use it in the out years. And so we I think that's best uh, dealt with through market rules. But I agree, you'll have fluctuation uh, based on weather events. Mr. Barstow. 
Yes, I would like to add, I really echo your concern. I think as we look across the performance of emissions trading systems previously, though, though there's a lot of concern about price spikes and cost containment, the empirically the most important phenomenon has been price collapses, where prices have turned out to be much less than we thought because, well, it turns out economic incentives work and a lot of innovation comes to the market. So one of the ways to, re to protect against that is uh, a reserve price in an auction, which makes, and that is a standard feature of good auction, good modern auction design, you're going to find it on eBay the next time you try to go auction something there. And so it puts in a floor on the value of emission allowances within an auction and there, thereby provides a sustainable expectations for innovators and new investors going forward. Do all, do all of you agree with that? I think so. yeah. then, I must, uh, then I guess I must agree as well. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly if eBay does it. <laughs> all right, gentlemen's time has expired. Um, I'm going to ask a, a final question here, and I'm, I'm then going to ask each one of you in reverse order of the original statements to each give us your one-minute summary of what you want the Select Committee on Global Warming to know as we're going through this year and trying to make recommendations on how to construct a program to deal with this uh, issue. Uh, we're also waiting for Mr. Blumenauer to run in, and hopefully he can make it here uh, before um, the end of that process. Mr. Bertel, let me ask you this question. Um, when we did the acid rain bill back in uh, 1990, uh, all of the allowances were given away. And everyone says that worked great. Um, what's different with this uh, problem, the CO2 problem? Why is that lesson from 1990 not applicable uh, to this issue of dealing with greenhouse gases? Because that's a very commonly asked question, and all of you on this panel seem to disagree. Uh, with that approach of giving away the allowances, and the acid rain uh, process did work. So what's the difference? There are two things that are different. Number one, that was only targeting the electricity sector, and in 1990, 100 percent of the electricity sector was under cost of service regulation. So that if regulators were awake and doing their job, they were going to make sure that companies could not charge consumers for something they had received for free. So consumers were well protected under traditional cost of service regulation, but today we've had half the country in the electricity sector move away from that for their very own good reasons. The second is that, again, that was only in the electricity sector, and today we're looking at a program that's going to affect the entire economy. So with that type of free allocation in the electricity sector, it made sense in that it suppressed electricity, that any change in electricity prices any more than needed to, be, to happen there. But when we go economy-wide, that type of an, of an approach for those regions of the country in the electricity sector that are still regulated will constitute a, con an, a subsidy to electricity consumption. And that's going to cause a, a disequilibrium in marginal costs across the economy and raise the costs of carbon policy significantly. Our modeling, for example, suggests that it could push up national allowance prices by 15 percent. That means all the other sectors of the economy are going to have to work that much harder. Great. Thank you. Um, I have received a letter from the uh, Southern Alliance for Clean Energy regarding the subject of today's hearing, and I would like to ask unanimous consent that it be included in the record without objection, uh, so ordered. Uh, let me turn now to uh, our concluding one-minute uh, statements, uh, and we'll begin with you, Mr. Greenstein. Could you please turn on your microphone? I think the case has been well made at this hearing for auctioning the permits uh, and also for the need, both substantively and politically, for consumer relief. So I won't use up much of my one minute on that. However, there's one issue I mentioned in, in my testimony we, we never came back to, and it's kind of, I think, maybe not on the radar screen. So let me spend 30 seconds on that. We really do need to pay attention to the fact that the price point, the increase in prices, which will create incentives for various efficiencies, will also raise the price of everything from heating school buildings, education at the state and local level, to a variety of federal programs from the Pentagon's cost to veterans' cost of living increases. And you need to make sure that there's some room within the allowances to deal with those costs that the public sector is going to occur. You don't want an impact of cap and trade to be cuts in local education budgets or cuts in veterans programs. And I, I know it's not as politically attractive as this incentive and, and that incentive, but I think it is a key part of what needs to be taken into account or we end up 
having cuts in basic services, increases in other taxes, or big increases in deficits down the road as a result of the impact of higher energy prices on the important thing that things that local, state, and the federal government does. Thank you, Mr. Greenstein. Mr. Podesta. Again, very briefly, the cost of doing nothing is a lot more than the cost of doing something. Uh, and I think if, if we get this right, uh, and I think uh, cap and trades at the heart of a new energy policy, uh, it can really power the economy forward. It's not as sexy as sort of complex, undecipherable uh, financial instruments. Uh, but maybe if we put the minds of the people who currently are on Wall Street, Wall Street trying to do that uh, towards uh, innovation in this sector, it will create jobs, uh, it will it'll create efficiency, it will create productivity, and it will be a great boom to places like South Dakota as well as the rest of the country. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Podesta. Mr. Bowles. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd ask your, your permission to include a longer appendix as part of my testimony I prepared for the committee. Hopefully, without objection, it will be included. Um, I would echo John's point about the clean energy economic opportunity. The United States, uh, the great inventor of uh, technology that is exported to the world in so many areas, has been lagging behind. Uh, Governor Patrick has made this a central part of his economic development strategy, and I think we need to start looking at it in the opportunity uh, context more. Second, I just would tell the committee we've also built in greenhouse gases to our state environmental review process, and we have seen new proposals for green buildings. We saw the Harvard-Alston campus agree to the first legally enforceable cap on greenhouse gas emissions from a real estate development project. That is another area that we can get into that I think is uh, important. Um, and third, I would just say send clear signals and level the playing field. Don't penalize early action states uh, as you move forward, uh, and measures like auctions really set an even playing field, uh, and I encourage you to move forward as quickly as you can. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bowles. Uh, Mr. Zappel, and again, a special thanks to you for being here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would to want to go back to the wider context in my closing statement uh, beyond the auctioning. I think we have seen both in, on the United States, in the United States, and also in Europe, we see that environmental markets can deliver. Sulfur and nitrogen oxide markets here, the carbon market starts to deliver in Europe. So there has been, I think, some of the debate you are having here now, should you go for a tax, should you go for a cap and trade system? We had the same debate in Europe, but now, three or four years after introducing our system, it has become a feature of daily business in Europe, and we got used to it. We got used to having a carbon price of some $30 a ton of CO2, and nobody has ever revised down our macroeconomic growth projections. So the economy can continue to steam ahead with a carbon price. The EU is ahead in the carbon market while you are ahead on the air pollutant markets. We have learned a lot from you from the air pollutant experience. Uh, we stand ready to continue this transfer, this dialogue, this transfer of experience from uh, where we are ahead on the carbon market. We are not ahead everywhere. On auctioning, I think we, we are a bit of a late come and we can collaborate even more there. So I think together, the US and Europe, we can make headways in, in building a global carbon market and solving the big challenge we have ahead of us bringing emissions, uh, greenhouse, down, greenhouse gas emissions down significantly over the decades to come. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Zappel. And, uh, and you are the cleanup, Mr. Bertrand. Yes, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I would just like to, to um, leave the impression that auction design is actually fairly simple. The emission, amount, uh, emission allowance is a very simple commodity compared to the spectrum auction or the daily electricity auctions, and this is not the time to go into it in great detail, but really it's dramatically simple. So, so do not be intimidated by the notion that designing and putting in place an auction for emission allowances is going to be a difficult thing to accomplish. It's probably one of the more simple auctions that could be designed, and, the, and, we, and it's not at all uncommon for the government to now charge for things that previously it gave away for free and uh, to put such a mechanism as such such as that in place. And secondly, I would just like to leave the notion, in my, the question in your mind with you of where does this value come from in the first place, that it really comes from citizens in the U.S. in terms of uh, the, the value isn't being taken out of the economy or get, or, and sent away or burned, but rather it's changing the way that property rights are assigned throughout the economy. And an approach that I think is a candidate approach with all others, I mean, from economists prefers an auction because of the opportunity to use auction revenue to promote economic growth and other program goals. But also another approach that it could be a candidate would be to use an FDR type of an approach and see that these uh, the emission allowances belong to citizens and they could be directly allocated to citizens. That would be the most way to achieve the most progressive income distribution as a consequence. Thank you, Mr. Bertrand, very much. And, uh, and I agree with you on that spectrum auction uh, point. And 
1993, uh, working with the Clinton administration, we moved over 200 megahertz of spectrum. Uh, we created a third, fourth, fifth, and sixth cell phone license in every community, and it revolutionized the wireless marketplace, moving from analog to digital. Up until then, we had given away the spectrum, but by changing the model, we actually created a more entrepreneurial um, environment and derive more revenues for the federal government. And I don't think it's as complex. I do agree with you on that as well. Um, before closing, I'd like to thank the outstanding panel. I think we're unanimous in that, that this was a first-class uh, panel and an excellent way to kick off this uh, important debate this year. I think we've learned that robust auctions and well-targeted revenue recycling must be a core element of a cap-and-trade system. This is the only way to ensure that we can meet the goal of saving the planet while keeping the playing field level, ensuring consumers are protected, and spurring innovation and economic growth as we move to a low carbon economy. I think it's also clear that we need to look closely at mechanisms uh, for oversight of auctions and the carbon market to ensure simplicity transparency and fairness. Uh, with that, this uh, hearing on carbon auctions uh, is adjourned, going once, going twice, sold. This hearing is adjourned. <laughs>